Okay, thanks for being here. Who's excited to be here? Who's excited to learn about gut health? I know it's not the most sexy topic on the planet, but you are going to learn today how your gut health literally does affect every single function and every single system in your body. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of you are going to realize today that you probably have gut issues that you weren't aware of uh, when, we put the, you know, when we connect the dots. Um, as I was preparing for this, actually a few weeks ago, I, I got asked to lead uh, a coaching call for a bunch of chiropractors around the country. And you know, the, the point of the coaching call was to talk about you know, what, what our mission is and what our heart is. Like, what is the purpose of our clinics? Because if you, if you don't know, if you're a guest, in fact, if you're a guest, meaning you're not a current patient at Summit, can you just raise your hand just for a second? I just want, I just want I'm not going to make you do anything embarrassing. I just want to know who you are. So I just want to say thanks for being here. I just want to say thank you for uh, taking time on your Saturday morning to be here. Um, you know, when you hang out with us, I consider you family. And, uh, so if you don't know, Max Living, we have, we have offices all around the country. We have over 200 offices in the United States and Canada. And when I got asked to lead this coaching call, you know, the, the whole point or the question is, what, what is the purpose of our clinics? Because you know, we all practice the same way, the five essentials of Max Living. But this word kept coming into my mind. And it's not a word that I use often. In fact, I don't think I've used this word since high school chemistry. But the word is crucible. Do you know what crucible is? Or can you remember the word crucible from high school chemistry? So it's a chemistry term, but one of the definitions that I really appreciate about the word crucible, and I think it parallels so well with what our mission is and and even why you're here today, because the definition of crucible is a place or a situation in which concentrated forces interact to cause or influence change or development. It's a place or a situation in which concentrated forces, who knows that we're concentrating all of our forces this morning. And it's not just our forces, it's your forces as well. It's your desire to become a better person, to manifest the fullness, the full potential that God put inside your body when you're born. But it's a concentrated, uh, or it's a place in which concentrated forces interact in order to cause or influence change or development. And I will say, you know, these last 18 months, I know we didn't have it quite as bad in North Idaho, but as a whole, as a nation, and even here, we, we went through... We went through some stuff, did we not? Uh-huh. We, we went through some stuff. And if you're here, um, you know, I just want to appreciate you because uh, a lot of us felt beat down, a lot of us felt discouraged, a lot of us felt isolated, a lot of us felt confused. You know, the media told us one story and then they told us a different one and then a different one. And even today they're telling us a different one. And, it's, and so it's very confusing, it's very frustrating. But you guys, a lot of you in this room continue to just show up. You continue to show up despite your confusion or your frustration or your isolation or whatever it was. And I can tell you, after doing this for over 10 years and over 15,000 people that we've been blessed to be able to serve, the, the number one common denominator between the people that get results and keep those results and the people that don't, it's, it's not extreme willpower, it's not money, it's not intelligence, it's just, it's just the willingness and the dedication to continue to show up. And so I think right now, more than ever, and you guys already know this, right now, more than ever, what we need, more so than even just a bunch of information about gut health, what we need more than ever is we need community. You need a strong room. I need a strong room. We need a crucible, a place that we can go where we can concentrate our forces to become different, to develop, to change, to evolve into the people that God's created us to be. And to be honest, that's why we go to seminars. You know, we personally spend tens of thousands of dollars every year and take our entire team three to four times a year, usually down to Orlando, Florida, to go to these max living seminars. And after 10 years, I can tell you that honestly, I don't learn a bunch of new information. In fact, I couldn't tell you the last time I learned, you know, something that was, you know, like an aha thing as far as information goes. What I do get out of it though, and the reason why I'm, con- why I'm willing to continue to invest and take time off and be away from the clinic and invest in our team that way is because being there elevates my consciousness, not because of the information, but because of the people. And so if nothing else this morning, what we wanna do is we wanna prov- provide you a place, a strong room where you can leave uh, elevated in your thinking, in your energy, in your vibration. And then if we can continue that, if we can create a community, we can change ourselves. And if we change ourselves, we change the world, right? Yeah. All right. You ready? We're learning about gut health. Okay. So why are we here? Uh, we are here to learn all about gut health, right? And what's interesting is if you look at statistics today, over 74% of adult Americans have gastrointestinal related issues, whether that's diarrhea, constipation, irritable bowel, gassiness, bloatedness, acid reflux, you know, something of that nature. And I think, you know, if if you are in that population of people, you probably easily understand why you're here and what your goal is for today. You know, you want to get rid of that thing. You want to learn about gut health so that you can get rid of that thing. What you may not know 
though, and this is not a new concept. Hippocrates is considered the father of modern medicine, which is still several hundred years old now. Um, but Hippocrates, even way back when, found this association between gut health and digestive health and overall health. And so what, what the science is now proving is that your gut and the health of your digestive system is directly related to um, issues not consistent with what you would think of as gut health related issues, you know, like, like the things that I just listed off, but more so things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, chronic inflammation, joint pain, uh, even cancer, ADD, ADHD, cognitive decline, memory issues. Um, I would say, and you can chime in on this too, CC, that, um, you know, one of the questions we always get is, how do I know if I have a gut issue? Well, some of the most common things might be what? Bloating, right? Constipation, diarrhea, um, indigestion. Um, but then there's some that you don't think are actually from your gut, and that's when it surprises people. Um, so just remember, just because you don't necessarily have an issue, you still could have issues with your gut. Like just because you don't have diarrhea, you could still have issues with your gut health. Yeah, and I think most commonly what we see is like skin issues. You know, so if you have chronic rashes or skin irritations, acne, um, that type of thing, you know, even extreme sensitivity to the sun or you burn really easily, a lot of times those can be digestive health issues, you know, absorption issues or toxicity issues. Um, energy is probably a, a really big one too. If, you, if you're chronically fatigued or if you chronically feel like you don't have the energy that you, that you should based on the amount of sleep that you get and everything else, um, usually it's a gut health issue. And it's either because you're not putting the right stuff in, that's obviously step one, but number two could be that you're putting the right stuff in, it's just not actually getting into your cells, right? And, that, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. You know, we're gonna talk about what is the gastrointestinal system just from an, from an anatomical standpoint. A lot of people think that it's just this long tube inside your body where you put stuff in and then stuff comes out the other end. And that is true, um, but more than anything, you know, it's the system in which we put stuff into our bodies, right? We intentionally put things into our bodies, hopefully good things. And then there's a, an entire system where we break those, food, those foods down, we break them down into amino acids, you know, glucose, simple sugars, fats, things that our bodies can actually use as the building blocks of repair and growth. Um, but it's not just a tube. You know, it's, it's made up of all of these different organs. And what's interesting is that if you stretched out your entire gastrointestinal system from top to bottom, mouth to the other end, any, any guesses the what the length of your GI system actually is? Like so here's about 8 feet, way. 10 feet. Huh? On average, depending on your height, <laughs> this is really obviously. Long. It's getting tangled. But anyway, I could go it's, all the way to the other end of the room. <laughs> wasn't supposed to be nodded. 30 feet. <laughs> on average, is about 30 to 35 feet, right? And the other interesting thing about that is that it's not just, it's not just a tube that's full of little holes. You know, it's not like a drip line for your, your planter beds or your garden, you know, where there's little tiny perforations to let water out and all that. Um, you actually have these finger-like projections along a, a large percentage of your GI tract, and each one of those finger-like projections also has additional surface area, right? And so the surface area of absorption for your entire gastrointestinal system is about the size of a basketball court. So if you were to stretch out, you know, not just the tube, but all of the finger-like projections called villi and microvilli, and then, the, and then calculate the surface area of all of it, it's almost the size of a basketball court. Is that not amazing? Like right here, right here. Yeah, it's all tucked in there. It's crazy. God is amazing. Yeah. So it's not, you know, like, like I said, I think we all understand this, that it's not what you eat that makes the biggest difference. Obviously it is. You've got to put the right stuff in. Um, but it's not what you eat, it's what your body actually absorbs and assimilates. And I think that's, I think that's the keystone difference, the, the, the biggest factor that we're going to talk about today, because you probably didn't need to give up a Saturday morning and show up here just to hear me tell you that an apple is better than a Snickers bar, right? Raise your hand if you did not already know that, <laughs> that an apple is better than a Snickers bar. Um, if you didn't, you'll need to come to our Nutrition 101 class. But yeah. most people know that it's not what you eat, it's what you digest and assimilate. Yeah, I just want, this is like incredibly powerful. This is the main function of your digestive system. It literally feeds your body. So it's feeding the cells of your eyes, your heart, your brain, your bones, okay? So um, you need to make sure that you are actually able to absorb those nutrients to fuel your body because you would not be here today if you couldn't, right? A um, couple stories I want to share with you. So I do... Um, free supplement reviews for our patients. And I had a patient that came in and was really excited to share her stash of supplements. 
And I was just like, oh, when I was looking at it. Okay, so she was really excited to share that, not to drop names, but she had gone to Costco and the lady there had really sold her on how this really inexpensive great deal of a supplement had like 10,000 milligrams of this said nutrient. So I just want you to know that milligrams is just a measurement of weight. It doesn't necessarily tell you how good that supplement is for your body. So we talked about this a little bit, okay? Um, I just want you to know that this is, um, you, the supplement industry is one of the most unregulated industries that there is. Um, you can easily spend a lot of time, energy, and money on supplements that are not getting absorbed. So instead of focusing on how cheap it is or how many milligrams is in that supplement, you need to focus on how bioavailable that supplement is so that it's getting absorbed and getting shuttled to the right place in the body. Yeah, and, and how would you actually know that? Just, just to throw this in there and interject for a second. How would you actually know how much vitamin B you know, how much vitamin B6 you're getting into your cells. Because you might be taking it, right? You might take a multivitamin, vitamin B, or you might be taking a B complex or something like that, but how would you actually know how much of that was actually getting into your cells on a regular basis? Any guesses? A lot of you have already done this, by the way. Yeah, you, you do a test, yeah. So that's, that's why a few years ago, and really within the last year and a half, we started you know, pushing, it, pushing it really hard uh, and testing a lot more people is because uh, we wanted to know, you know, and, and ultimately this started with Aaron and I, I mean, and a lot of you don't know this, but we've been doing advanced nutrition testing since we opened. It's just that for the first seven years, we were only doing it on ourselves. <laughs> and it was just because we knew how valuable it was. We just didn't have a great system or a person, a coach who really had the bandwidth to make it available to more and more people. So can I share a story on that testing yeah. for a minute? Okay. So I did have a patient that came in, um, lovely, lovely person, and she, she was working with a naturopath. Um, she had low energy, was struggling to lose weight, had a lot of inflammation, and she brought in this list. It was a full piece of paper with all these different supplements she was taking, and they were very high quality supplements, a brand that you guys probably recognize. Um, but she was just really frustrated because she just wasn't making any headway. So what we did is we tested her, and we found out that she was only absorbing about 10% of those supplements that she was taking in her body. And what we were able to do is identify where there were hiccups, and I'm gonna tell you the biggest place was in her gut, right? So once we were able to work on her gut, we were able to retest and see that her bioavailability went up by 40%, and then we just kept working on it. So you have to test so that you know, and this also is just like incredibly powerful to know how important your digestive system is to absorbing and utilizing not only foods, but those supplements that you're taking. So you're not wasting your time and energy and money, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we're, it's all about making, making your digestive system like, like fertile soil so that what you put in there is actually going to take root, you know, and benefit your body. So we're going to transition a little bit and talk about the microbiome because in terms of anatomy, you know, I think we all get the fact that you, you have uh, an esophagus and you have a stomach and you have a small intestine and a large intestine and all that. Um, but the most crucial element and the most damage in the highest percentage of people is your microbiome. Did you guys know that your body has more viruses, fungus, and bacteria than you have human cells in your body? Your, your body is made up of about 76 to, 7 to 80 trillion cells. You have over 100 trillion just bacteria, and then you add on funguses and viruses, and those aren't bad things. In fact, if we did not have those things living inside of our bodies, we would cease to exist. God's created our bodies whole and perfect, and that's just the way it is. We need those things. Just like if you're into gardening, we know that there has to be bacteria and, and uh, you know, this, this micro ecosystem full of life. Your soil's not dead. It's not just dirt. There's a difference between dirt and soil. You guys get that? And if you just have dirt, nothing's going to grow. It's dead. It's not actual organic matter. Um, the problem is that um, a lot of people, because of antibiotics, poor diet, stress, um, dehydrate, chronic dehydration, toxicity, we have ruined our, our microbiome. And really, having your microbiome be out of balance is pretty much the essence of what we're going to be focused on for the most of today. Mm -hmm. Your microbiome is individual to you. So Dave, yours is not the same as Joanne's, right? And it's pretty amazing. It is like your blueprint. Um, it is your genetic footprint, so to speak, and it determines your unique DNA. It determines your predis predisposition to different diseases. And it even plays a role in your metabolism. It determines your body's set weight. So that is incredibly powerful, okay? Yeah, th um, think about that just for a second. 
I mean, that was, that was, that's like a writer downer. You just kind of skimmed over that. That's, pretty big, that's pretty big stuff. Okay, so I'll say Your it again. Your microbiome determines, and microbiome is basically the, 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 the proportions or the, um, the percentages of good and bad bacteria. In fact, that's what we're going to get into here in just a minute. Um, you, you need good bacteria. Unfortunately, we have some bad bacteria in there too, and that's natural. Um, but as long as our good bacteria far outweighs the bad, then you're healthy. If your microbiome is out of balance amongst a whole plethora of health issues that could manifest as a result, one of the most interesting is that your body's set weight, like it's, it would be like you're trying to set the thermostat at 68 and it keeps pushing it to 74. No matter how hard you try, you're trying fans, you're trying electricians, you're trying all these different things, but the code is pre-programmed because of its environment to keep setting it at 74. Right? And I think that's where a lot of people become frustrated. And that's why microbiome and gut health, I mean, this is huge, huge stuff. Because how many people, raise your hand, have tried a diet or you've tried fasting or you've tried a workout program to lose weight or get fit and it, was, it didn't work as well as you thought it should have? Could possibly be a microbiome issue. Your thermostat is just set to the wrong set point. Yeah. Okay, you want to talk about the gut-brain connection? Yep, so this is, you have this entire gut-brain access, and it's the communication between your central nervous system and your gut. And what I want to share is that, you know, your brain contains about 100 billion neurons, but your gut has like 500 million. So both of them do, they talk to one another. Um, you ever had a gut instinct before? That's your brain talking to your gut, right, giving you that feeling. Um, this, this is a big, huge role of your digestive system, and it is incredibly important for your mental health. So you have about 30 neurotransmitters that you make inside your, your microbiome, okay? So dopamine, 50% is made inside your gut. Serotonin, the happy hormone, the happy neurotransmitter, 90% is made in your gut. So there's a huge connection about how you are feeling. Um, so when I talk to people and they share with me that they're suffering from depression, anxiety, even have ADHD, ADD, even autism. We go to the gut always because this is a huge role that it plays in your health. Well, and the problem is, you know, mental health is such a big issue with our current healthcare system and our population today. You know, in fact, statistics show that six out of 10 Americans are depressed or anxious, and six out of 60% of those people are clinically depressed or anxious, meaning they've been, they've been given some kind of psychotropic medication to deal with that anxiety or that depression. And I'm not saying there's not a time and a place, but the, the cause of that condition is never a lack of medication in the body. Do you guys get that? Like, just to keep it simple, the cause of your headache is never a lack of ibuprofen in your head. Mm -hmm. The cause of indigestion is not a lack of Pepto-Bismol in your stomach. And so the cause of these cognitive disorders or even behavioral disorders is not a lack of you know, mind chemistry or brain chemistry changing medications. Do you guys understand that? And the problem that I have with our traditional allopathic model today is that eight out of 10 times you go to a medical doctor, you walk out with a what? <laughs> prescription drug. Those prescription drugs have what? Side effects, because why? They're chemicals, they're made in a laboratory. Anytime you put something inside your body that's not made in nature or found in nature, you're gonna have side effects, right? It's a toxicant. And the other problem is, is as soon as you're put on that medication, Typically, you're told to take it for how long? And why would you have to do that? If the medication worked and it cured your problem, couldn't you take it until you're cured and then get off that stinking thing? Right. It doesn't work that way. And again, I'm not saying there's not conditions that don't require medications to be help, you, help you manage forever, but those are really few and far between. You know, the, the average American, listen to this, the average American over 60 years old is prescribed 12 different prescriptions every year. And if you make it past 72, it goes up to 20. And again, to circle back, how many of those people, and these, the, there's, those people are in this room, and I'm not picking on you, I'm trying to help you, right? I'm trying to show you behind the curtain a little bit. How many of those interactions where you go to a doctor and you're diagnosed with a, uh, a condition, which is really just a name, by the way, that's why I don't like diagnoses, because a, a diagnosis is just Latin for the problem, right? You know, it's like someone comes into my office and they're like, oh, my, my elbow hurts. And uh, so we do some tests, I'm like, yep, yeah, you, have, you have ligament inflammation, and, you know, whatever, and they're like, well, my doc, you know, I went to my doctor, and they, f they ran a bunch of tests, and they were able to figure out it's, it's actually tendonitis. And I said, well, do you know what the definition of tendonitis is? It's inflammation in a tendon. That's all it means. It's just Latin. You know, they just use a big fa fancy word, you know, to whatever. The problem is that none of those doctor's visits are ever spent figuring out the underlying cause and then addressing the underlying cause, right? If you have anxiety or depression, there's a reason and it might actually be a good reason for right now. Maybe you're going through a season that you need to actually deal with, right? 
But you also need to understand that if, you, if your microbiome is out of balance, I mean, think about this for a minute. You take someone who goes through something like COVID, right? You take two people who go through COVID. Did you guys know that depression rates went tenfold through COVID? Anybody see that on the news? And it probably is not surprising if you didn't. Tenfold. Suicides. Fivefold. All, you know, just, just from COVID. We take two people going through the same exact situation. Person A has a screwed up microbiome, which helps produce dopamine, serotonin, your happy hormones, feel good hormones, fulfillment hormones. That person's microbiome is shot, so their dopamine and serotonin are way low. Person B has a really healthy mi microbiome, and those serotonin and dop dopamine levels are really high. Who comes out the other end healthier? Who's more susceptible to anxiety, depression? Who's more susceptible to suicide? Who's more likely to get on a medication that, that ultimately has side effects and they're told they gotta be on it for the rest of their life? Do you see what I'm saying? And so again, a lot, a lot of what today is about is thinking differently, asking different questions. Don't listen to the media and have them, let them tell you, stop asking so many questions. Stop doing your own research. Stop posting stuff on social media. Stop being an advocate for your own health, right? Just fall in line, do what we tell you to do. We have your best interest at heart and we're making millions off of you believing that, right? It's time to take charge of your own health, be your own advocate, but ultimately go upstream, find the cause and fix the cause. Otherwise, you end up doing what so many other people do. And in my mind, it's unnecessary and it's ineffective. All right, sorry Dang, for the tangent. that was so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, have, I'll let you, your turn. <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't know if I can beat that. Okay, so gut and immunity. This is the third role your digestive system plays in your health. 70%, some argue even more. Um, of your immune system is in your gut, okay? So you have the largest amount of lymphoid tissue in your digestive system. Um, and this is where the most of your immune cells live so that they can fight pa pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and keep you healthy. So another reason, incredible reason, as to why you need to have really good gut health. Causes of interference. Um, this, this one's a big one. So dysbiosis, anybody know what dysbiosis is? No, okay. Uh, so dysbiosis is an imbalance of the good bacteria to bad bacteria. Um, essentially what you want is you want to have a high ratio of the gut-friendly good bacteria to overcome any of the bad bacteria so that you guys can be as healthy as possible. You can be symptom-free and you can live a vital life. Um, the problem is, is that due to poor diet, high amounts of stress, environmental toxins. Many of us, our microbiome is actually home to billions of very harmful pathogenic bacteria, fungus, yeast, um, so on and so forth. So dysbiosis is, is tricky. It's actually very, the, those bad bugs are very, very smart. So when you have dysbiosis, it doesn't come on like a classic infection. You don't all of a sudden get sick, you aren't vomiting, you don't have like a fever. Those bad bacteria learn how to coexist with you because it's in their best interest. They don't want you to become uncomfortable. They don't want you to even recognize that they're there, all right? So um, it's amazing the role that dysbiosis um, plays in your body. I think we might have another slide that speaks to that. So we know with research that dysbiosis is the cause of many health um, conditions and diseases, all the way from arthritis to autoimmune to the skin issues like Dr. Ryan talked about, to food sensitivities, to even cancer. And we know that dysbiosis could promote the progression of colon cancer. You guys, I don't know if some of you were at the last Migor event we did, I had shared that my dad was just diagnosed for the second time with cancer, colon cancer, it had metastasized to his liver, stage four. Um, the first time he had cancer, um, right before he was diagnosed, I actually met my parents in Las Vegas for one of my family members' weddings. We shared a hotel room together. I hadn't seen them in a long time, and I spent about four hours talking to my dad about health and what was going on with his health. And he shared with me all these digestive issues that he was having, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I could totally help you. Why didn't you tell me this like years ago? Um, so I gave him some recommendations. I mean, he had every classic symptom of digestive issues. Um, he was constipated a lot. He even had like sinus congestion, sinus um, infections a lot. Anyway, he went home. He took my recommendations, but what did he do? Nothing. 30 days later, my mom calls me to tell me that my dad has been in the hospital because of constipation, and they found out that he had stage three colon cancer. If I would have known all of this earlier, I would have had him get tested so we could actually see what was going on in his gut. I know just from my experience and all my education and training exactly what he needed to do, but testing would help him confirm that because you know you don't always listen to the people that are closest to you. You listen to the, some stranger. 
Um, so it's just amazing how much your gut affects your overall health and leads to chronic illness and disease. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just it right there. I mean, we, this is our home church, and Pastor J.O. always says that it's not information that transforms you. It's information plus application that creates the transformation. And, that, and that's just it. I mean, you guys are getting a whole ton of information today. Um, and it's not, it's not the information that's going to change you. You know, you're not just going to magically go home and be healthier for it. You've got to actually apply it. And I would actually encourage you, maybe don't try to apply all 27 things that you learned from this morning, because the likelihood of follow through with that kind of situation is very low, because I've tried it. Um, just pick the one to three things that you think you could actually do, right? And then build from there. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, this whole dysbiosis connected to, you know, here's one about cancer, here's another article all about dysbiosis and hypertension or high blood pressure. Um, this is interesting for a couple of reasons, because do you guys know what the top two killers in America are every year? Heart disease and cancer, right? Did you know that statistically or scientifically that they've been able to prove that over 99% of cancer and heart, heart attack or heart-related um, heart deaths are preventable through lifestyle? They've been able to prove it. I mean, that's British, British Medical Journal, CDC, American Heart Association, American Cancer Association. That's not even a discussion anymore. And still, when you're a cancer patient or you're a heart disease patient, you walk into a cardiologist or an oncologist, how much of that time is spent working on your lifestyle? Doing, doing tests to, to measure your microbiome, right? Or things that cause inflammation that would lead to high blood pressure or hypertension right? No, it's because there's no money in that, unfortunately. And again, I don't think the doctors are bad doctors. I think they're just stuck in this system where they get paid based on treatments and prescriptions. And that's just it, right? But that doesn't benefit the patient. It's not an outcome-based patient. Could you imagine, think about this for a moment, could you imagine if healthcare professionals today only got paid or got paid based on the outcomes of their patients? Did you, do you realize that it's one of the only professions on planet Earth that is compensated not based on performance. If you're an athlete and you suck at, at shooting the basketball, if you're a basketball player and you can't score points, you can't defend, you can't rebound, do you get paid? Not only do you not get paid, you get cut. You find a different job, right? Every profession or every industry on planet Earth is like that except for healthcare. Why is that? It's because the people are not in the driver's seat. You guys are not in control. It's insurance companies, it's lobbyists, it's drug companies. And do they make more or less money based on you being healthy or sick? If you're sick, do they make more or less money? More money, right? You, you can't, I forget who said this. It's not, uh, anyways, a philosopher. But he said, yeah, a system can never prevail. Yet truth can never get out if an industry is built on the uh, purveyors of that industry not understanding the truth or not sharing the truth, Right? And so it just, they can't bite the hand that's feeding them, right? My mom's an ICU nurse, and she'll be the first one to tell you. It's the most frustrating thing about her job because she's got three sons now and a daughter who's, who are all doc chiropractors and into wellness, and she would love nothing more than to sit down with the patients that come into the ICU and teach them all about this stuff. But you know why she doesn't? Medicare don't pay for that. Blue Cross Blue Shield don't pay for that. And she still has mouths to feed at home, you know? So the point is, again, today is about getting actual science and using our brains, using our logic and our intuition, because I think deep down we know what's right, we know what we should do, we know what's wrong, we know what's a lie, but the problem is we're stuck, you know, and a lot of this is becoming, or about becoming unstuck. You kind of already touched on this one, um, but the allopathic approach or traditional medicine, um, especially for the digestive system, when we see something going on or bad bugs, our go-to is to literally just bomb the city with antibiotics, right? So antibiotics kind of have their place. They can be effective, but they also cause a whole host of problems because they're very damaging because they completely wipe out the good bacteria that is in your gut. Um, Dr. Ryan talked a lot about this already. I mean, we're just being fed. This is another lie that medicine is the answer for everything. And I just want you to know, this is one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be working here with Dr. Ryan, um, with Max Living, is that our approach is one where we want to help you get to the root cause and for you to understand that your body is amazing. You just need to know what to do and, and have the right resources and uh, remove the interferences. So. Um, yeah, not that you guys needed to know this uh, or needed research to prove this, but when you take an antibiotic, what happens? A anti means what? In medicine, anti means to kill. Biotic means 
bacteria. Yeah, so an antibiotic, by definition, kills the bacteria. And yeah, there are certain really extreme crisis type situations where an antibiotic might be necessary. Um, unfortunately, and this is, this, again, we saw this more over the last 18 months with COVID and other things than ever before. Did, did you know that uh, four out of seven viral infections, people are given antibiotics? Not an antiviral, an antibiotic, but it's a viral infection. And the problem is that when you bomb the city, when you take an antibiotic, right, I, I kind of think about it like if you had a jail and you had a bunch of bad guys and you had a bunch of good guys who are protecting the rest of us from the bad guys, well, it'd be like if we just bombed the entire jail. We killed all the bad guys, but we also killed all the good guys, all the, all the guys that were in there trying to protect the rest of the community, right? So there's a place, unfortunately, I would say nine times out of 10, it's being used incorrectly. And it does damage your microbiome. And so if you've ever taken antibiotics, don't feel bad. I have too. I grew up with a mom of the nurse, remember? <laughs> so I took a few rounds myself growing up. Um, just know that if you've taken one round of antibiotics ever, you have to do something specifically and intentionally beyond just diet and lifestyle alone to rebuild your microbiome. You've got to either take a, a really potent micro or a probiotic. You've got to do some kind of gut renew protocol, but you have to do something intentional to rebuild, to get back to neutral. Otherwise, you're at a deficit. In fact, studies show that if you've had one round of antibiotics and then you just continue to live your normal lifestyle, your chances of getting cancer go up by four times, 400% because your microbiome is so integrally related to your immune system. You have to rebuild that, otherwise you're more susceptible. All right, inflammation, the cause of everything. Inflammation, yes, it is the root cause of all disease. So dysbiosis leads to something that we call leaky gut. Leaky gut then leads to inflammation, and inflammation is literally the root cause of all chronic disease and illness. So it's really important to uh, focus in on your gut health to reduce inflammation. Yeah, if, if you've um, been, become a new patient within the last six months or so, or you're, you've been a, a long-term patient, you've had a progress evaluation, there's a high likelihood that along with your newest set of chiropractic recommendations, we, always, we also made recommendations to do an inflammation protocol, which is a, you know, a combination of eating different foods, hydrating, uh, proper movement in your body, um, a couple of supplements that are really powerful for inflammation, like curcumin, joint health, uh, optimal omega, Mm -hmm. Okay, I thought that was me for a second. Um, but the reason why is, it's, it, the reason why is most people that come into our clinic um, come in because they have some kind of mu musculoskeletal issue. They have some kind of pain, back pain, neck pain, headaches, joint pain. Um, and so by giving you that, that anti-inflammatory protocol, it's gonna help you get out of pain faster. But the reason why we're so passionate about it, why we're pretty much recommending it for most people is because of how much it impacts the rest of your health too. Right? If you have high blood pressure, we're going to tell you to do an anti-inflammatory diet. If you have cancer, anti-inflammatory diet. Gut health issues, anti-inflammatory diet. Knee pain, anti-inflammatory di diet. Anxiety, depression, anti-inflammatory diet. Why? Because inflammation is a part of every disease or pathological process on planet Earth. Right? And so if we can start with something really simple like just de-inflaming your body, typically people have better energy, they have less pain, they have better gut health and they ultimately just recover faster, you know, because inflammation is like little micro fires in your system. If we can put out those fires, now the fire department can work on rebuilding and not just putting out fire the whole time. Yep. Okay, leaky gut. Have you guys heard of this term before? Yep. Awesome, so I don't have to dive too deep into this. Basically, leaky gut is a term used for um, intestinal permeability. So your gut lining, the lining of your intestines, plays a huge role in your health. It's literally, what helps you to absorb all those nutrients you're getting from your foods and from your supplement. And it's really easy to damage it. Um, it's important to note that, that that lining of your intestine is only one cell thick, so it's super delicate, right? I like to think of it as cheesecloth. So it's intertwined with these nice tight fibers, but there's enough space that the micronutrients that you get from your food and your supplements can pass me. through to feed the rest of your body, okay? So this is literally how you feed your body. Um, gonna so be, we're, gonna, we're, gonna do, yeah, we're gonna show you how this works, just to have a little fun. I tested this out in my kitchen last night and it worked great, but I have a feeling, you know, something could happen. <laughs> so I have in here water and some um, black beans. So the water represents the micronutrients, what's supposed to go through your gut intestine and your... Let me do that so you yeah. can talk. Yep, and then the beans this. represents the bad stuff. 
because you're you're trying to protect the rest of your body from toxins, hold it up so they right? Can see. From foods that not are not digested. So when Dr. Ryan Good pours that, the beans should not go through, right? Just the water, right? That's how it's supposed to work. Okay, good. Now, you can take that away. What happens when your gut lining is damaged? You can cut some holes in there. Okay, so how do we damage our gut? It's from things like medications, toxins, stress, even gluten damages your gut lining. Kids, do kids cause this? Yeah, they cause a lot of stress, so sure. Okay, so let's pour. Let's see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's very leaky then. <laughs> Hoping those holes are big enough. Oh, this they are. That's, those too, are, yeah. So healthy. what happens is, is these tight junctions open. Here, hold it up a little and bit. And everything that you're trying to protect your body from starts to get through. So those beans are going right through. So oh. undigested food, right? Toxins. And your body sees these as foreign invaders. So it could be something healthy that you're Good. eating that has gotten through your gut lining and your body now mounts an attack against it and creates these antibodies. And this is how you get food intolerances, right? This is what leads to systemic inflammation. This is what leads to autoimmune diseases, cancer. Just like we said, we said inflammation is the root cause of all disease. So it's really important that you take care of your gut and you prevent leaky gut from happening. Can you guys give it up for Dr. Sienna? Dr. Sienna is one of our new doctors, by the way, and Dr. J. Dr. J, you want to stand up for a second? Yay. He'll be up here later. He didn't know that, but he's going to be up here later. So <laughs> you can be nervous for the next hour. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, what's interesting about leaky gut, and the reason why it's so um, yeah, profound, I mean, it's just an interesting thing, is this is how people become allergic to healthy foods. Like, have you ever thought about the fact that, like, why am I allergic to almond butter or almonds? Or why am I allergic to apples? Well, not or, allergic. You have intolerance. Or okay. into yeah, intolerant. Yeah, and it's because you're, the, the way your, your body's designed is those food pieces are not supposed to get through at least to that magnitude. And it's just more than your body can handle, you know? And uh, so your body has to mount a defense against it, this reaction. And then your body kind of becomes accustomed to this reaction and so every time you put that in your mouth, now all of a sudden your body has a reaction, you know, even if it's not a lot. I'll so. have patients get super frustrated because they'll do a food sensitivity test and they'll come back showing that their favorite foods is what they're most intolerant to. And it makes complete sense because that's what you're eating the most of. It's getting through that leaky gut and your body's mount mounting attack on it. Now, the good news is that you don't have to have an intolerance to those foods forever. Once you heal your gut, you should be able to eat those foods again, except for, I'm going to say gluten. <laughs> True, true story. We'll get to that. Yeah, so direct symptoms of poor gut health are all the things that you would naturally think of. You know, upset stomach, um, unintentional weight change, sleep issues, fatigue, food sensitivities, bloating. Um, but like we said earlier, you know, gut health or leaky gut plus inflammation leads to disease, you know. So now they're doing a bunch of research and they're finding out that leaky gut along with um, or similar to having, a, having dysbiosis or a, a, you know, a crummy microbiome not only leads to digestive type issues, but also degenerative illness, like heart disease, cancer, um, you know, neurocognitive disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So it's a big deal. You got to pay attention. I would say, you know, and you could speak to this probably more accurately because you're the one looking at the test results mostly, but um, I would say way more people have leaky gut or dysbiosis than realize it, yep. you know, even if, even if you don't think you have GI issues. Yep, absolutely. Um, can I share my story for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, the reason why I want to share my story, and it's actually long, so I'm going to try to make it short, um, is that I know that there's people in this room that can relate to parts of it, and I just want to inspire you to know that you can make a huge change. It doesn't matter how old you are and what point in time you are in your life. Um, you could take action today and completely change your health. So I, um, gosh, it started when I was little. Um, when I, uh, well, I should say, let's start with food. Um, McDonald's was the coolest thing in the world when I was in elementary school. Getting a Happy Meal, Fruit Loops, oh my gosh, I could eat cereal that held all these different colors and just tasted like pure sugar. It was amazing. My favorite thing to eat, I'd come home for lunch to hang out with my mom as I would dip my peanut butter and jelly in Frito-Lay cheese sauce. 
and it just went on and on and Yummy. on. I became completely addicted to processed foods and sugar. Head into high school, I almost didn't graduate high school, and it's not because of grades, it was because I missed most of my high school years due to being ill. I was in the emergency room all the time. I had digestive issues. I had tubes, cameras put down, up and down, and all around my body, never to find an answer, except for I was put on medications, or it was all in my head. Um, fast forward to going to college. I ate and drank like a college kid does. Um, and I missed an entire semester of college because I had mono, so I had to go back home. Fast forward to my early adult years. Uh, I worked retail. I traveled around the country. Every meal I had was in a food court mall or at a restaurant. I had it, it needed to be cheap, easy, and fast, and it just needed to provide me energy or fill that craving. You guys, I was sick for so long. I had the flu, horrific flu, every single year. Um, if you look at my health history, I'm labeled as an MS patient. I had an episode of Bell's palsy. Um, I had viral meningitis. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I got to a point where I couldn't handle it anymore. I was like, done, and I drew a line in the sand, and I said, no more. I'm not taking any medications. They don't work. I feel like crap. Something has to change. And so I made little changes. I started out just by simply switching out my Coke for water. I had no idea that I'd been con chronically dehydrated for my entire life until I started drinking water. Um, I started my day with a smoothie, and it was full of nutrient-dense nutrition, and my body started to crave real food. And that was like the catalyst. Um, I started eating real food, food by God, not by man. And then I started to work out. I didn't, I'm, I'm not a Dr. Ryan, I don't even come close to that, right? But I could find 12 to 30 minutes a day or a couple days a week to work out. Um, I changed my mindset around food. For me, food literally was just, like I said, feeling a craving, feeling that need to have some energy. And I switched my mindset to realize that food was my life. That is the only way that I was feeding and fueling my body and it was the only way I could be healthy. Um, well, not the only way, but a huge way, right? I realized once I came to Max Living and started working with Dr. Aaron, Dr. Ryan, that I had literally switched my life to living a five essentials life. I was just missing one piece and that was the chiropractic piece. But what I want you to know is that, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, I also did, you know, so I made some great changes. I got inspired, I got excited, I decided to go back to school. I did a complete career flip. My husband was about to murder me because I had this really high paying, amazing job that I left so that I could go back to school and become certified as a functional nutritional therapy practitioner. And I just kept going and learning and learning. And I learned about how to do testing. So even to this day now, both Dr. And Ryan and I, we, we test we test our bodies to see where we have imbalances because it's, it's ever evolving. Um, I'm now at this stage in my life, this might be too much information, but I'm at that age, I mean, my oldest just graduated high school, where I have to start thinking about what I need to bring balance into my life as I go through this dreaded thing called perimenopause and menopause. So I'm getting ready to test again to see where I have imbalances, because I know my gut is going to play a huge role in my outcome, and I do not want to be on hormone replacement therapy, right? So I just want you to know, you absolutely can change your health, you just have to get back to the basics, and that's why I love working here. I love the, the role that I play in the office because I can help you to do that. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And that's, that's what you'll find. I mean, we're all, we're all on this journey too, and none of us are perfect. I mean, it's interesting. My, my latest test results actually just came in yesterday, and Cece and I are texting back and forth, making notes for today. And, and I was like, hey, did my test results come back? She's like, they literally just showed up in my inbox. And so we talked about it a little bit. And I've, I've got some deficiencies too, you know, and I'm taking really high quality stuff, but there's a couple little things that I'm not absorbing enough of, you know? So we're gonna do some, a little bit of gut stuff, and then I'm gonna take a little bit extra something, and I'll retest in probably three to six months. Um, but really, you know, what that's all about, it's all about finding your blind spots. You know, who knows that if you have blind spots in your vehicle, you're a lot more susceptible to accidents. You guys know that? Um, shoring up those blind spots just means that you're safer. You know, you can drive with more confidence and certainty. So you want to talk about SIBO briefly? Yeah, anybody heard of this one before? This is a type of dysbiosis. It's very common. Um, it is brought on by a lot of the things that most of us consume, things we've already shared like toxins, um, gluten, alcohol, stress. 
Um, what's interesting to know is that 50% of people with IBS have SIBO, 75% of those with fibromyalgia myalgia have SIBO. Um, so this is just another form of dysbiosis. And um, again, it is linked to all kinds of health problems. I tell you, if you, if you have SIBO, it's, it's not very fun at all. But it's basically when the gut bacteria that is supposed to be in your large intestine, it moves up to your small intestine and you get an overgrowth. Those bad bacteria are so stinking smart, you guys. They will do everything, like I said before, to make sure that um, you don't come after them, <laughs> that you don't find them. So they actually create what we call a biofilm. They'll create this layer over their little nest so that you can't get to them. So you have to be really um, intentional and specific and know exactly what kind of bacteria you're dealing with so that you can help to eradicate them. Yep. Um, so here's the question, can you heal? Is it possible to heal? What do you think, yes or no? Yes. It is, yeah, I mean, if you go home today and you paper cut your hand in three or four days, what happens to that cut? You heal, that's evidence that God put innate intelligence, innate just means inborn, God put it there, and from conception to birth, you've got this intelligence, right? That same intelligence that takes two cells. If you guys ever thought about this, this is just mind-blowing. Two, two cells, one from a man, one from a female, two cells come together, and nine months later, you have a human being, I mean, is that not miraculous? Yes. But that also doesn't happen because we will it to or because we, un we understand all of it or because, you know, we make it happen somehow. There's this innate intelligence, this intelligence, it's the same intelligence that causes a seed that you put into your dirt or your soil to all of a sudden flourish, you know, and bear sustenance. It's that same intelligence. I've always said all you need is in the seed, right? You just have to give the seed what it needs. And so that's the thing. If you want to heal, and, and I'm not just referring to gut health stuff right this minute, you guys. I'm talking about if you just want to be healthy, if you want to hear, heal from back pain, from migraine headaches, from fibromyalgia, from irritable bowel syndrome, for, from autoimmune issues, uh, or maybe you don't have any symptoms, but you just want to make sure that you're as healthy as you possibly can, your body is just like that seed. You've got to give that seed what it needs, and that seed will just naturally, over time, become what it was supposed to become, right? Because all of that intelligence is already in you. Just like a farmer can't give the seed anything that that seed doesn't already have. If that seed is supposed to be a watermelon plant, it's going to be a watermelon plant. There's nothing that he can do from the outside in that's going to change that. All that he can do is interfere with that process so that it doesn't become what it was supposed to become. Do you guys get that? You have this amazing life inside of, the, inside of you that you were created for, but you have to be intentional. Just like a good farmer, you've got to give your body what it needs. And so this is, this is the vitality continuum because health is not stagnant. You're not at a set point. You don't just have what you have and that's it. But this is, this is really important. You know, something that you guys need to understand and I'm going to hit this a couple of times today, but th there's this thing called the danger zone when it comes to your health. And the danger zone is when you feel good, but you're functioning bad. You know, Aaron's, I think Aaron took the kiddos out, um, but Aaron's mom five years ago passed away of pancreatic cancer. And you got, most of you have probably already heard that story. We're going to do a big cancer and immunity event in October, and she'll probably help lead that. But the, the most interesting thing and the most shocking thing about her situation was that when she got diagnosed, so she got diagnosed about a week before Thanksgiving, five years ago, and December 22nd, she passed away. And the beginning of November, that same year, she had no signs or symptoms. She was in what I call the comfort zone, meaning she felt okay, she looked okay, so she wasn't doing anything different with her health, right? And that's kind of human nature. Like if, if, if the check engine's not, light is not on, why would you think to do something about the engine or take it to the mechanic? The problem is that studies actually show that you have to lose about 40% function in your body before, you, before your check engine light comes on. And that's for anything, whether it's back pain, neck pain, headaches, numbness and tingling in your arms or legs, fatigue issues, digestive issues, blood pressure problems. In order for you to even consciously be aware of and, and recognize a symptom of any kind, you have to lose about 40% function. So that 100 or 99 to 60% function area is what I call the danger zone, right? And the point is that we just can't let ourselves get too far along that road. Otherwise, we're going to be trying to play catch up. And unfortunately, so many people, like my mother-in-law, wait until they get the diagnosis or they start having the symptoms. And then at that point, it's either a long, arduous uphill battle the rest of your life or 
there's no amount of fighting that's going to save you, right? So that's the whole point. Don't wait until you're broken to try to fix yourself. And I think that's why you're here, you know? So I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir because most of you are, or many of you are here because you want to do that. But I just can't reiterate enough, you know, health shouldn't be reactionary. You've got to stay ahead of it. And that's what we do with the five essentials. You know, I mean, that's why um, we focus on all five of these essentials. And it doesn't matter if you come in with back pain, we're still looking at all five essentials. If you come in with gut health issues, we're still looking at your spine. If you come in with mental issues or cognitive issues, we're looking at your fitness levels. We look at all five essentials no matter what. Why do we do that? It's because you're not just a spine. You're not just a stomach. You're not just a brain. You're not just a liver. You're not just muscle. You're a whole person. And so this is whole person healthcare. And in my mind, this is the only way of doing healthcare or managing your health that actually makes sense. Because unfortunately, the model in America today is if you have a heart problem, you go where? Cardiologist. If you have a cancer problem, you go where? Oncologist. If you have a knee issue, you go where? Orthopedist. If you have an autoimmune condition, you go to an endocrinologist, right? You go, you go to all these specialists, and not that they don't have their place, but they're dissecting and addressing the body like a bunch of individual and, and separate parts and pieces. And health never works that way, right? Just like your gut health affects your mental health and vice versa, if you're treating your mental health, but the issue is actually in your microbiome, you're going to end up stuck and frustrated, and you're not going to get very far, right? So with that being said, how do you know which of the essentials you should work on most? Because if you're like most people, myself included, it's very difficult to work on all five essentials at once because of time, money, focus, family, just life, right? So obviously, we want to give the squeakiest wheel the most grease. So how do you know which one is your squeakiest wheel? Well, you might already have symptoms that tell you, and that's obviously a good place to start. But if you don't, how would you know that? Well, glad you asked, because Max Living um, just came out with a way to know. And this is really cool. So you guys should have, should have gotten a text or an email yesterday so that you had the opportunity to do this beforehand. But I want you guys to take some time to do this life, life risk questionnaire, questionnaire this LRQ. Um, the, the very first slide of the day was that slide with a uh, QR code. You guys it's should all have also, this. Yeah, it's on the top of your order form. Do you want to talk about these two? So these are just two examples real sure. quick. I should have worn my glasses. I can't see that far back there. <laughs> okay, use, so um, these here. are two different scores we got back from some patients that we have. Uh, so the score on the left which is high risk. Okay, so this was a patient that came to me, um, all, all types of different health issues, um, lots of health goals, and doing the LRQ really helped us to be able to prioritize with some key nutrients, where to focus, um, and even showed us that the recommendation was to do advanced nutrition testing um, so that we could kind of take it to the next step. The patient on the right came to me with no real issues. Um, they were eating great taking lots of really great supplements, exercising re regularly, looking at this person from the outside in, you were like, wow, they're like a picture perfect of health. Um, but what we discovered was that they had some blind spots. So they did have some blind spots with their nutrition and is that mindset that it says up there? Yep, so we were just able to make some adjustments, make some recommendations um, so that they could be as healthy as possible. You'll find that after you do the LRQ, you're going to get a report back to you, and it's going to have some really great links to different um, supplements. Sometimes it can be overwhelming, but that's where we're here to help you, to be able to identify and kind of prioritize where to start first. Yeah, I, I would say don't actually jump right into doing all those recommendations. Um, I would say consult with one of us first, because I know many of you are already on some kind of protocol, um, whether it's for me or CC, and so we just want to make sure that we're not overlapping our efforts and giving you unnecessary things because you may actually be doing some of the things that it's recommending we just want to coach you through the process so our, um, I would say when you're looking at it so there's there's four categories right there's vulnerable there's high risk there's living well and then there's max living our whole hope and dream is that we can help you to be in that max living category and be a max living warrior so yeah and if i had to summarize it this way you know, if you're a patient, you might think that my desire is that everyone is just a chiropractic patient for the rest of your life, and that's my ultimate goal. Um, that's not actually my goal. My ultimate goal is that we would be able to get you to a place where you feel like you're 100% in control of your own health, meaning you understand what it takes to be healthy, you're equipped and empowered to actually take action on a regular basis and make it more of a lifestyle. Now, that being said, someone who's in complete control of their health and values their health, what do they do on a regular basis? Get adjusted. Mm -hmm. Right? 
and the other four essentials, right? Because it just makes sense. I mean, I've always told our team and many of you, if you knew what I knew after so many years of, of, of education and practice and patient cases, if you knew what I, would, what I knew, you would do what I do, right? Because it just success leaves clues, you know? So anyway, um, the other thing about the LRQ is everybody that fills that out, we already had probably 50 people fill it out between yesterday and this morning, um, but we are, gonna, we are gonna send emails out because we also get a copy of the results. We're not gonna share those with anybody, but they get sent to CC. Um, we're also gonna uh, email out everybody that fills out the LRQ and just give you an opportunity to schedule what we call a five essentials consult. And there's no, there's no cost for that. CC's gonna meet with you for about 10 to 15 minutes. She'll go through your LRQ first. And many of you have already done this recently. So if that's you, this doesn't apply because you're already, um, we're already getting you taken care of. But if you haven't ever done a five essentials consult, um, we're gonna use this as the basis for our conversation. And then that also will serve as an opportunity for you to talk about current supplements you're taking. Am I taking the right thing? Am I taking too much? Is this high quality? Is this even necessary? But the LRQ is where we need to start because if you don't do that first, the first thing she's gonna have you do is have you take this first and then you're gonna be sitting in a consult room for 30 minutes and we actually don't get the results don't right that, that. <laughs> that fast anyway. Yeah, so let's talk about three steps to heal. Um, and these are pretty obvious, but step number one is you gotta identify the cause. You know, again, if you have headaches, it's not because there's not enough ibuprofen in your head. We gotta find the underlying cause. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, it's not because you don't have enough prednisone or steroids in your body, even though that's what they typically give you. Now, those things can help with pain. They can mitigate some inflammation, but they also have long-term, really detrimental side effects, if you didn't know that. So we wanna to get to the underlying cause always. Number two is we wanna address the interference. So the interference is basically what is the cause? You know, there's, there is a cause. If you have chronic inflammation, again, there's a reason. There's something, causing, there's something causing interference in your body because a little bit of inflammation's good, right? Like if you have a baby, your body should be inflamed afterward. If you, if you tear, tear your Achilles tendon playing basketball like I did, there should be swelling, there should be redness, there should be pain, there should be, you know, tenderness and instability. Why? Because that's my body's way of healing itself. But when that process gets out of control, that's not a good thing. So we got to find the thing that's causing the interference. And then number three is we got to restore function. You know, we got to restore vitality. And we do that through the five essentials. The, the, the problem is the five essentials is not a one size fits all. And that's why as we've evolved over the last 10 years, we've gotten a lot, a lot more specific with each of the essentials. You know, right now, mostly it's chiropractic, and we can be very specific with that based on taking your x-rays, and that's why we still take x-rays on you every one to two years, even when you're in maintenance care, because I don't want to give you the one-size-fits-all adjustment every time you come in. I want to give you what you need based on what your body's doing right now. And we're also starting to do that, or have started doing that with nutrition over the last couple of years, you know? It's one thing to go on a blog or Pinterest or YouTube and look at what someone has to say about weight loss in general, but out of 100 people, 100 people don't have the same exact weight loss issue, right? For some people, it's toxicity. For other people, it's, it's just knowledge. For other people, it's a microbiome problem. For other people, it's exercise. It's not one size fits all. Um, so we've got to restore vitality specifically for you. Okay, causes of poor gut health. Obviously, nutrition is one of the big reasons. I want to read some statistics for you because I think they're powerful. More than two thirds of Americans do not eat fruits or vegetables at least twice a day just twice. 82% do not want to give up the foods they like. 62% say they have no time to track their diet. 60% say they like to prepare meals in 15 minutes or less. 15 minutes, whoo. 36% say they have, not, have no leisure time to get physical activity, okay? Um, I have shared this before, but Obviously, one of the biggest factors in poor gut health is dysbiosis, which comes from a poor diet. I literally want you to think about this. Every time you eat, you are casting a vote. Are you going to feed health or are you going to feed disease? And what you put at the end of your fork is incredibly powerful to the type of health that you're going to have. So nutrition and what you're eating is critical. It doesn't have to be complicated. So we're gonna share with you the top five foods to avoid to have a healthy gut. The first one being sugar. Now, we don't have to talk to you about how bad sugar is for your health, right? But what I want to point out is that in relationship to your digestive system and your gut, um, your body, when you eat sugar, it goes into your small intestines to be absorbed. And it can only absorb so much. So whatever is left over travels down into the large intestines. And in your large intestine, this is where you're starting to make vitamins, recycle vitamins. You're breaking down your, your prebiotics, your fibers, your minerals, your vitamins. You're getting lots of um, 
dense nutrition there. If there's sugar down there, it's going to feed bad bacteria. So sugar equals bad bacteria. And like, that's just the basics of it when it comes to sugar, okay? Yeah, the other thing about sugar is that artificial sugars um, also have deleterious health effects um, because anything that you put in your mouth that's sweet, your body innately, because it's anticipating that it's gonna be sugar or glucose um, or a form of sugar, your body innately starts to release insulin. So it's interesting, even if you're chewing gum, that's sweetened with xylitol or stevia or a natural sweetener, let alone something that's more toxic like aspartame or sucralose or Splenda, something like that, your body actually produces insulin. And the problem is that too much insulin wears out the insulin receptor sites on your cells. And if that goes on long enough, that turns into a condition that we know as diabetes. Diabetes, diabetes is really just insulin resistance. It's not, it's not always just a blood sugar issue. It's a blood sugar issue because you don't have enough insulin to keep up with it. You can't get enough sugar out of the cells but it can actually start even if you eat a low sugar diet, even if you're, but, but if you're eating uh, artificial sweeteners. So number one, get rid of the sugar. Number two, don't swap it out for artificial sh uh, sweeteners. Number three, try to just not eat that much sweet stuff, even if it's healthy stuff. Because even if it's like stevia or honey or you know, xylitol, something that doesn't actually raise your blood sugar, you can still end up with insulin resistance from that if it's too much. Sugar causes leaky gut, it's another thing. <laughs> All right, gluten. Gluten. Okay, well, this one's near and dear to my heart. I can tell you, once I removed the gluten, my digestive um, health changed dramatically. Um, so how many of you know someone who is either gluten-free or celiac, has celiac? Yeah, it's becoming finally very well known on the damages that it has to our digestive system and our body. Um, our grains are not the same as they were hundreds of years ago. Now they are genetically modified. They don't resemble what it used to at all. Um, and it's ruining our health. So they also are full of toxins, right? So glyphosate is um, very prevalent in um, our grains. Gluten, glue, is literally what it means. It is glue that makes your breads your baked goods like sticky and fluffy, right? So it's really important when you're making pizza or bagels, things of that nature. Um, what is so bad about it is that it triggers um, the release of a very inflammatory protein called zonulin, okay? And this is a big leader in um, causing leaky gut. So gluten is in things like wheat, barley, and rye. A lot of times if you have a gluten sensitivity or intolerance, you end up having issues also with dairy or even corn because your body starts to mimic um, that intolerance. Um, one thing that you need to know is that just because you are eating a, f a food that says that it's gluten-free does not mean that it's healthy for you. <laughs> There are so many gluten-free foods out there that are just processed garbage, just like the regular processed foods are. So you absolutely have to read labels and see what's in, in what the ingredients are. Well, and a lot of the gluten-free packaging <clears throat> or messaging doesn't even make sense anymore. You know, it's yeah, just I everyone wants gluten-free, so it's like gluten-free apple, gluten-free <laughs> sunflower seed. I, I bought a package of grass-fed beef jerky the other day, and it said gluten-free on the top. And I'm like, well, why would there be gluten in my beef jerky anyway? Anyway, if you need to go so, gluten-free, I'm a great resource for you. I mean, literally, food by God, not by man. Um, I have been gluten-free for 13 years, and it's a, a piece of cake. I don't even, it's not, not an issue. Yeah, just remember that gluten, even though you may not have a reaction or think you have an intolerance, gluten produces zonulin. Yep. Zonulin That's causes it. this. So this is happening to your GI system when you consume gluten. And it's a vicious cycle. Your GI, your uh, gut lining will heal every four days, but if you eat gluten, it's going to damage it again. Then it will heal. Then it will damage. Then it will heal. It's just this vicious cycle. And that's, and that's the good news. You know, if, if you have a meal with gluten in it, does that mean you're screwed the rest of your life? No. You just can't do it consistently, right? Make the pros outweigh the cons. You know, take more positive action than negative action in your life, and you'll naturally move in a positive direction, right? Activity is just a, a gradient. It's like water on a slope. As long as you're taking even just 51% more positive action than the 49% negative action, even though that may not be earth shattering, you'll still gradually move in the right direction. All right, conventional meats. This is, this is a big one. Um, we're not gonna get too, too much into this, but you know, like Cece said, try to consume food by man versus food by science. You know, a good example of food by science is when you, when you consume farm-raised fish, you know, farm-raised fish uh, it's not good because, you know, they feed them things. Fish don't typically 
eat in their natural habitat. They're raised in an environment that's not typical. They're not, you know, swimming upstream and overcoming resistance and eating the things that they would naturally eat. And so it changes the molecular uh, makeup of their proteins and their fatty acid profiles and amino acid profiles. What's, what's really fascinating about this, and this sealed the deal for me. You guys can go look, look this up if this would help you. But if you go to YouTube and you type in uh, packaged salmon, so like farm-raised versus wild-caught salmon, what they actually do is farm-raised salmon, um, the color of it is like a really, really uh, pale pink. You know, it's almost more like a trout or something like that. And so what they do is they literally inject it before they package it and vacuum seal it and send it to the stores. They inject it with red food dye because we know just naturally that in nature, salmon should be bright red, you right? Or like a dark pink. And so uh, go watch that, and it's very unappetizing, and you won't eat farm-raised um, salmon ever, ever again. Here, here's the main reason why this is important and why it pertains to this. When you eat, when you eat meats that are conventionally raised, like grain-fed beef, you know, um, feedlot chickens or eggs, farm-raised fish, um, what it really does is it messes up the fatty acid profile, the omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio. And in a normal situation, most naturally raised meats are going to have a ratio of about 3 to 1. Even grass-fed beef will have like a 3 to 1, 6 to 3 ratio, which is ideal for our body. It reduces inflammation, it helps fight off cancer, improves cognitive, fu- uh, co- improves cognitive function, um, almost just like a salmon, like a wild-caught salmon. Grain-fed beef, by contrast, has a ratio of, th- of sixes to threes that are 20 to 1, and sometimes up to 40 to 1. And that imbalance of sixes to threes causes infl- inflammation. And that happens with fish, too. Right? Then you end up having to spend a bunch of money taking a ton of fish oil to try to balance that out. And that's the thing. I mean, I, all the time, we get patients who want to save an extra two bucks and buy the grain-fed versus grass-fed beef, but then they'll spend 50 bucks a month on a fish oil supplement. You should be getting your nutrients from food. If you're going to put your money anywhere, put it into quality food. Then let's worry about supplementing, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a supplement to what you're currently doing. You shouldn't get your nutrients from food and then, or from supplements and then eat like garbage, right? Mm-hmm. All right, next one is... It's the, same, it's the exact same concept for the damaged fats. Yeah. Yep. So um, it's that imbalance again. It leads The bad fats leads to inflammation in your body and will obviously give you leaky gut. Um, you have to pay attention, you have to read labels. So you wanna avoid like the plague, any hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils, any type of vegetable oils. Just like Dr. Ryan said to Google about the farm raised fish, you should Google how they make canola oil. You'd never touch it ever again, okay? Um, yeah, it's, it's borderline a petrochemical. I mean, yeah, it's, it's bleached, it's, it's just, it's disgusting actually. It does not resemble the seed that it came from at all. Um, And then also pay attention when you're cooking with oils. You can take a really healthy oil and make it rancid just by cooking it at too high of a heat. So once you get to about 180 degrees, you chemically alter that fat that you're cooking with. So if you're cooking with higher heat, things like coconut oil, avocado oil um, should be your go-to. But you really do have to to read labels. I always like to tell um, the patients that I'm working with, you can take an amazing nutritious salad and ruin it just by the salad dressing that you put on it because of the canola oil. Um, that's in it. So, so read labels. This is where we usually lose a few people. <laughs> um, so here's my, here's my disclaimer. You don't have to give this up altogether. In fact, uh, there are some studies that support the idea that a little bit of biodynamic organic red wine can actually improve gut health. And bitters. And bitters can improve gut health. Um, however, you know, too much alcohol. Alcohol is acidic. It's toxic. And a lot of alcohols out there, especially hard alcohols, have sweeteners and artificial colorings, and it's just, it's just not good, you know? So if you're, if you're trying to put your body into a position where it can heal from within, obviously doing too much of this is only gonna undercut your efforts. Yep, this is what you should be eating to have a nice healthy gut to reduce inflammation. So we've got two different um, nutrition plans here at Max Living. We have the core and we have the advanced plan. Um, I will tell you with my own journey when I was, um, drew that line in the sand and wanted to start getting healthy, I started with the core. And um, it's just a great segue from if you're currently eating a standard American diet, going to the core plan is going to be a great next step for you. Okay, well, there's three basic principles with both the core and the advanced plan. What we've been talking about, you want to um, eat food by God, not by science, okay? Um, And then you want to skip the sugar and the sugar alternatives, and then you want to focus on the toxicants and not the calories. So again, reading those labels, look at those ingredients. Can you pronounce the words? 
that they have listed as the ingredients. If you can't, you shouldn't eat it. Okay, so those are just the basic kind of foundation and principles um, for both the core and advanced plan. Yeah, and the nice thing about the calories thing, you know, I know there are diets out there and programs out there that make you count calories and restrict calories, and those can be effective at achieving a short-term goal, but they're usually not very sustainable, and they're just a real pain in the butt to do because <laughs> you're calculating everything. What I have found in my own diet, and also just worth working with lots of people over the years, is that if you eat nutrient-dense food, you won't overeat. Mm -hmm. Like, can anybody ever, ever, can anybody remember a time when you overdid it on broccoli, and you're sitting there on the couch just like, oh, I knew I shouldn't have done that extra handful of broccoli and hummus, because I just feel like going to bed now. It doesn't happen, but you do that all the time with pizza. I mean, I, pizza's my kryptonite, and so, um, yeah, I mean, it's more than once a month, but when I do, it's like the wheels come off, I let my hair down, all the things. You it can, enjoy it, it can, and you let it go, though, right? It can get ugly, but yeah, then the next day I work it off. Anyway, so yeah, the point is that um, the reason why we recommend not counting calories is because it's not sustainable. You know, we want to create a lifestyle here and not just a short-term thing. Um, and the truth is, if you eat nutrient-dense food, you won't have to anyway, because your body will tell you when you got enough. Yep. So basically, you're going to focus on good quality protein. You're going to get in those good, healthy fats. So no bad fats. Um, you are going to focus on whole grains. Um, so you're going to avoid all of those refined processed grains. And you're going to opt for um, lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, more so fruits and vegetables rather than getting most of it from grains, OK? Um, and then. Just some basic principles, again, just like eat and enjoy till you're full, choose organic when you can, um, and it's gonna go a long way. So these are some, or those were some of the top five foods to eat routinely, and it really just be, comes down to protein, vegetables, lots of greens, nuts and seeds, low glycemic um, fruits like berries, and then the healthy fats. Then we move into the advanced plan. So this is really geared towards healing. Um, the difference between the core and the advanced plan is that uh, you're going to focus more heavily on the good healthy fats. You're still going to have very high quality protein, but you're going to eliminate the grains completely. Grains turn into sugar in your body, and so we want to avoid having that sugar and feeding those bad bacteria. Okay? Um, and then you're going to choose more low glycemic fruits and vegetables. So you really are sticking to berries. You're sticking to lemons and limes and a green Green apple. You know what is amazing is when I have a patient come back and tell me, oh my gosh, I had no idea a green apple could be sweet. That's when you know that you've hit that sweet spot with your nutrition. Um, who should be on the advanced plan? Uh, there's some guidelines that can help you identify. So if you have any type of cognitive dysfunction, um, if even including ADD, ADHD, or on the autism spectrum, advanced plan is great for you. Same with metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obes diabetes obesity, even high cholesterol, high triglycerides, um, any type of blood sugar issues. Um, and then things just like chronic fatigue or high toxicity, fibromyalgia, um, issues with your immune system, issues with inflammation. And even looking at your skin as well, those are signs of inflammation as well. So if you have psoriasis, eczema, um, the advanced plan would be great for you. How long do you need to be eating to the advanced plan? Well, it really just determines on at what point you overcome those health goals that you have. Uh, so it could be for 30 days or 60 days. I'm telling you, it's not that hard once you get into a rhythm um, and you, you learn how much your body loves to eat this way, you, you'll find it much easier to eat to the advanced plan. Once you've hit those health goals, then if you want to, you can go back to the core plan, okay? So hopefully that gives you some good param parameters. Yeah, the, the advanced plan is really just a really aggressive ketogenic anti-inflammatory diet. I mean, that's really what it is. Um, the reason why we don't use the term keto diet is because there's a lot of, a lot of people who do keto wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, they do dirty keto, and they think as long as they just eat nothing but bacon and butter, and, and they cheese. don't eat the bread, then they're good to go. Technically, that might fall into the category of keto, but that's not, that's not healthy keto. You know, that's not what your body truly desires. So, um, yeah, and again, these, these, are, these are just eating plans that are designed to help you, um, depending on where you're at, with your health in this current season. You know, the core plan should be something that you could be able to live on forever very comfortably. Um, the advanced plan is more if you're trying to heal from something. I mean, that's, that's the word that I would use to, to distinguish between the two. If you're trying to heal from anything, a torn Achilles tendon, advanced plan. High blood pressure, cancer, advanced plan. For how long? Until you're better. Then go back to the core plan, right? 
And if you feel really good, I still recommend doing at least like a 30-day stint of the advance plan every year. Like if your health is here and you're really happy with it, still give your body maybe 30 days to just kind of reset. You know, just totally rid your body of all the inflammation just for 30 days mm -hmm. and you'll, you'll go to the next level. Yep. All right, we're gonna talk about the three R's of gut healing. Before we do, okay. you I want to talk share, about Kelly? Yeah, I want to share Kelly's story with you guys. Um, she is a patient of ours. Uh, she was dealing with a lot of gut issues. Um, she, like many people, she had constipation, um, bloating. She just felt really, really inflamed, especially in the middle section of her body. Um, she was suffering from depression, um, struggling to lose weight, and she came in and met with me, and she was just in tears. She had just, like, had enough. Um, she had gone the medical route, met with lots of different doctors, um, recommended medications, but since coming to um, Summit Family, she realized that she didn't want to be on medications. She knew that there was another way to live. And so um, this was affecting not just her view of herself and how she felt, but it was also affecting her relationship with her family because she was just really moody and irritable. And so what we did is we recommended the Max Metabolics program to her, so um, that included advanced nutrition testing. Um, so we did tests, and the answers that she was looking for showed up on the test results. Um, it was awesome. She was so incredibly excited. And so this is where we became a part of her health journey. So we really focused on the right types of food. She did the advanced plan. We gave her the support to do that. Um, she had very key supplements that she was focusing on, and she had a very systemic approach or systematic approach to how we addressed her health issues. And what she ended up doing and what we do, what we did for her was that we, she basically did the three R's protocol. So we're going to share with you what that is. Um, I want to share with you what she experienced. Um, this is what she shared with me. She just said, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for all you have done for me this year. My gut health has never been better. I, and she said, I hope the test, like the retest shows that. I feel better in my tummy, which in turn is positively impacting my mental health. I have accomplished more in the last three months than I have in 10 years because my brain and my body allowed me to. Now I can focus more on me and my physical and hormonal health without having 20 million, million things nagging me. I'm sitting here this afternoon feeling so accomplished and good inside. I have you to thank for that. I cannot believe how much my gut health impacted my mental health. I have learned so much since taking your program, what to and not to eat, um, how each food and drink makes me feel, and I've tried things I've never in a million years thought I would like, like juicing and actually liking it. You are a very special person to me and such an amazing woman. I truly feel grateful and blessed for having you in my life. She did all the hard work. We were just there to guide her along and be her support and, and like give her the roadmap. So this is one reason why I love testing is because it took out all the guesswork and we knew exactly what her body needed in that point in time and how to address it. Um, so yeah, she has, she's in this amazing place. Gut issues are gone. She's been able to deal with her depression and um, her family is so incredibly thankful. Yeah, so <clears throat> we're going to talk about the three R's, and really the reason why we tell stories like that is um, if, if someone like Kelly can do it, so can you. It just takes application. You know, it's not complicated, um, but that doesn't mean it's not, it, that doesn't mean that it is easy, right? And that's why, that's the value of this strong room, the reason why we're in community together and why you have us to help you along the way, because we're going through it personally ourselves, um, but we can help you along the way. So we're gonna go through the three R's. The three R's really simply are remove. So when we talk about remove, it's all the stuff we've already been talking about. You know, it's just getting rid of the bad stuff. So quit putting it in there because if we spend a bunch of time, energy, and money trying to get it out through detoxification or taking supplements or whatever it might be, but you continually put it back in, you're just retoxifying yourself is what I call that. So step number one is remove. Step number two though is to repair. There's basically two ways to do it. You can either let nature take its course and change your lifestyle, but you may be waiting years or decades before your body fully regenerates and repairs itself, or you can do some things to help accelerate the process, right? And in my mind, there is a situation or there is such a thing as better living through science. What I don't mean by that is, you know, hacking your health with a bunch of chemicals and outside in types of things. What I mean by better living through science is we know information, we know of certain herbs and vitamins and nutrients and micronutrients um, and enzymes that can help us repair at a faster rate. And that's not something that's not natural because you could go out into nature and find all those things and consume a lot of them to get your body to heal faster. It's just that doing that's very difficult to actually go out into nature and do that. So that's why we've spent time putting together this whole protocol to help you repair faster. 
Okay, we have some amazing nutrients. So licorice, slippery elm, they've been around for thousands of years to help people with their gut health and digestive issues. Um, they really help to um, have that healthy intestinal barrier and a good mucosal lining. There's also a nutrient, it's actually an amino acid, it's called L-glutamine, and it is absolutely amazing. So it's going to help just regenerate the cells in your gut, get rid of any opportunity for leaky gut, um, and minimize any type of damage that you may have in your, in your GI. Um, the these three nutrients, along with a couple other profound nutrients, is what we have in our Gut Renew supplement. Okay, I, as um, Dr. Aaron had shared, I did a lot of extensive certification in the area of digestive health. This was the go-to supplement for healing the gut. It's absolutely incredible. So it's going to not, not like these ingredients, but this, this exact formulation. Supplement. Yep, this this is it. Gut Renew. So this is our go-to. So it's gonna support the mucus layer of your gut, it's gonna maintain the right balance of bacteria, it's gonna keep your gut wall really strong, prevent leaky gut, and it's gonna heal your gut from any type of inflammation. Yeah, okay. so just, just think of Gut Renew is gonna help you with that, right? So just to give you kind of a picture or a visual. So in the repair phase, we've gotta patch up those holes, obviously, um, but then we also have to um, uh, re-inoculate, which we're going to talk about in just a second. But let's talk about digestive enzymes just for a moment, because what I think is fascinating, and you can talk about application, but what I think is fascinating is after the age of um, 30, 30 or four, yeah, 30. after the age of 30, the average adult produces 1% less digestive enzymes every single year. You know, so at 40, you've got 10, your body's producing 10% less digestive enzymes than it did at 30. At 50, it's 20%. 60, it's 30%. Um, and digestive enzymes are what your body uses to help break food down right? So it's kind of like you have this, this machine in here that moves and contorts and contracts and it breaks stuff down, but it's the enzymes that help break things down on like a biochemical level. Yeah, some things that you can be experiencing that are like signs that you need to focus on having a digestive enzyme are bloating, gas, even reflux, um, and feeling really full after meals. Um, sometimes people can wake up the next day and not even be hungry, and it's because their food has not digested in their stomach. It's just sitting in there, and what happens is it starts to rot and ferment, and that's where you get the indigestion, the heartburn, the gassiness, um, and all the bloating from. Um, so the digestive enzymes we have is like our baseline product. Um, we absolutely love these. Uh, it has all the digestive enzymes that you need to break down your protein, your carbs, and your fat. It also has um, an enzyme to help you with gluten, to break down gluten, and it has betaine HCL in it, which is gonna help you um, with reducing that heartburn, um, GERD, um, and then indigestion. Um, I will let you know too, when it comes to dairy, after the age of three, you lose that enzyme that you need to digest it. So it's also found in this supplement as well. Yeah, another indicator is if you're really tired um, after meals, you know, even yep. if you have a, a nutritious, healthy meal, if you're tired after meals, you probably would benefit from digestive enzymes. And I've, I've eaten really clean for, gosh, 20 years now, uh, but there was a period of time where no matter what I ate, I just felt zonked afterward, like I needed a nap. And uh, so I didn't, I didn't do it forever, but I did find out that um, I needed to do some gut work. And during that time, I, I took digestive enzymes at least once a day with my bigger, more protein-dense mm -hmm. meals, because I think that's really where digestive enzymes probably have the most benefit, is helping you break down protein, because proteins are the most difficult thing that we eat that your body has to break down. And the, the reason why you get tired is if you don't have the enzymes, your body's recruiting a lot more resources and energy to break that stuff down so that you can ultimately use it. But if you're using that energy to digest your food, you can't use that energy to live your life. Mm -hmm. That's why you feel tired. Yeah. Uh, and then this is, this is a huge one. I mean, this is what you, something you said to me after we had done testing on people after about 12 months and we had done probably 150 tests on people. Um, I remember asking you, we were in the office and I asked you, what's, what's the one thing that keeps showing up that every single person has needed? And it was fiber. Does anybody know how much fiber you're supposed to have every single day? I told you, didn't I? What is it? 25. Yeah, 25 for women, 30 for men. Think you get anywhere near close that to that each day? Where do you think most people get their fiber from or think they get their fiber from? Huh? Oatmeal. Bread, <laughs> pasta, oatmeal. Yeah, grains. Yeah. And yep. you do get some fiber from, the, from those sources, but you also get all the 
crummy stuff that comes along with it that we just talked about. You have to really make a conscious effort to get in that amount of fiber. Um, you literally have to eat like five servings of spinach or cauliflower. You need to have like five servings of berries and then you need to have a whole handful of like nuts and seeds. I have gone through the effort. I don't know if you've ever used my fitness pal, but I use it every once in a while to just check myself and see how much fiber I'm getting in for the day. Um, and you have to, you have to work for it. Um, but it's absolutely incredibly important. Most people don't realize the impact that fiber has on their health. Um, it helps with everything from you know, diabetes to high cholesterol to cardiovascular disease to cancer. So fiber is absolutely critical um, to your health. And you have to eat it. You have to eat those 25 or 30 grams every single day forever. Okay, so one of the easiest ways um, to help get in some additional fiber is to take our fiber supplement. Supplement It has three grams of soluble fiber. Um, and soluble fiber is generally hard to get. Um, it really um, needs to come from lots of fruits and vegetables. And it also has what we call acacia gum. And that is a soluble fiber that acts like a prebiotic in your gut. So prebiotic is what helps to feed the good bacteria. So it's like food for your garden. Um, so you can just take this when you take your digestive enzymes or take it right before a meal. It mixes really easy into water, and there you go. Yeah, and talking about fiber is a great segue into prebiotics uh, or into the re-inoculate uh, phase. So this is the third R for gut healing. Um, but re-inoculate is just, you know, we want to replenish the microbiome that we may have destroyed, either through antibiotic use, medication use, poor lifestyle, stress, you know, uh, all, the, all these different things. And I think most people here probably understand the benefit of probiotics, right? What you may not realize though is that probiotics are living organisms and just like any other living organism, they gotta, they gotta live by eating stuff, right? They gotta, they gotta stay alive by, feed, by feeding themselves. Um, the difference between what makes a really high quality probiotic versus one that's just cheap and inert or dead is the prebiotic aspect. So. There's a couple of things. CC's going to talk about our probiotics and why they're, why they're great because um, they have, uh, or probiotics, they have prebiotics in there. But fiber is also where your microbiome gets prebiotics. So even if you're not taking a probiotic, in order to replenish and nourish the microbiome that you already have, the good bacteria, you've got to get enough fiber. Because if you're not getting enough fiber, it, for you it may not result, result in diarrhea or constipation. For you, it might just be that you're not feeding the good bacteria enough of what they need, and then that ultim ultimately turns into some other kind of health issue mm -hmm. down the road. Probiotic 50B. Um, what we did is we researched the most effective strains of bacteria and put them into this supplement. So there's 50 billion live bacteria in here. Um, so it's a very diverse um, amount. Um, when you're looking at probiotics, you'll see that it's labeled as CFUs, and that's just telling you how many um, bacteria you're getting in each dose. Um, the other part, and what most people don't realize, is that these probiotics have to actually um, survive going past your stomach acid in your bile. So most pro probiotics out there, I would say maybe only up to 25% actually makes it into your large intestines where they need to go to work. Um, ours is formulated with what we call a delayed release. So it's gonna survive the stomach acid, it's gonna survive the bile, and it's gonna get to where it needs to go. So it's very, very effective and absorbable. And then lastly, the shelf life. Um, that's also really, really important. Um, we've tested our probiotic. Um, you don't have to refrigerate it, it can stay out. I ultimately always put mine in the refrigerator, it's just something I do. But you don't have to, so it's really great to travel with as well. Um, we did a test where um, we opened up the probiotic and um, we just left it out and 24 months later it still held up to the amount of bacteria that was in there so it, it stayed true to its claims so that's another thing that's really really important when um, going for and choosing a probiotic it's also part of why the bottle is amber colored yes if you didn't know that if you're buying supplements with clear bottles it's usually not a not a good thing um, you know where, where can you get probiotics from food obviously you can get them from fermented foods things like kimchi sauerkraut uh, plain organic yogurt, um, anything that's fermented. The problem is it's just hard to get those things in your diet every single day, you know. And if you're the t like, if you're like me, I don't love kimchi. I will eat it because I know it's good for me. But I just, you know, my wife calls them no thank you bites to our kids. <laughs> She's like, come on, at least just take a no thank you bite. And I'm like, all right. I don't love kimchi, but I really like sauerkraut, and I really like some of this other stuff. Problem is. 
uh, you're only getting certain types of probiotics, you know, and there's many, many, many different strains of uh, probiotics that are out there. So that's why I think a supplement is a good idea unless you like eating all of that stuff and you eat all that stuff on a regular basis. So I think it's a great way to just re-inoculate and you don't have to do that forever. You know, people that say, oh yeah, you should take a probiotic for the rest of your life, just like a multivitamin, you don't need to do that. In fact, you shouldn't do that because if you do that, you can create yeast issues, you can, you can create SIBO, you can actually have too much bacteria in your, in your gut. Um, so again, testing is a great way to find out what you do and don't need. Um, but for the average person, I would say, you know, if you're, if you're replenishing gut health, you know, a good probiotic is a good, a good way to do that. We're going to talk about max metabolics. And you've heard us mention this a bunch already, so we're not going to beat a dead horse. But ultimately, you know, max metabolics is our advanced nutrition program. And it's the program that Cece's in charge of. She's already kind of told you why we do it. Um, to me, I'll just say my two cents and then you can, you can finish up here and give people instructions. But the way I look at it is, you know, I had, I had a patient come in as a chiropractic patient about a week ago, and um, they, they were like, hey, you know, I have these issues going on, and I really don't want to take x-rays. And I said, well, I, I can adjust you without x-rays. You know, I do that. But if you, want to, if you want me to feel super confident, if you want me to have the most amount of confidence knowing that I'm adjusting you and giving you the treatment that I think is 100% the best thing you need, based on all the information that we have available, I wanna see some x-rays. Because I can literally look at your problem, we can measure it with our software. Um, not only does it help us identify the exact problem, but it also serves as a baseline that we can go back to after a series of, or after a period of time, and then measure from. You know, it's no different than standing on the scale and then starting a weight loss program and then standing on the scale again. It just makes sense. If you don't ever stand on the scale in the beginning, it's very subjective. You can still do it, you can still exercise and eat right, but it's kind of based more on how you feel, right? It's very subjective. Max Metabolics and the metabolomics test that Cece's gonna talk about, to me, is no different than x-rays for a chiropractic patient. You can do it without it, but it might be a little more frustrating and there's, there's no way to actually guarantee that you're doing the exact right thing for your body, right? Because you're basing your activities or your actions on norms, right? Do I know that doing a certain type of adjustment helps most people with migraine headaches or sciatic pain? Yes. Would seeing an x-ray confirm or deny that so that I can give you exactly what you need? Yes. Yep, okay, so the max metabolics test, it is a urine and a blood spot test. So we are able to, this is like the Mac daddy of all tests that we have in the clinic. We're able to check vitamin and mineral deficiencies, blood sugar imbalances. We're able to check inflammation. Remember this is the root cause of all disease, right? Oxidative stress, you know how you cut open an apple and it starts to brown, that is oxidation. That's literally happening to our cells um, on a regular basis and it is what leads to premature aging. Um, we can check your toxicity. How is your body able to detoxify? It's supposed to detoxify every single day on its own, um, how is it doing with that? Does it need help? We look at heavy metals, we look at fatty acid imbalances. What is your ratio of the good omega-3s to the omega-6s so you can manage that inflammation? We look at amino acids, we look at neurotransmitters, and then we also look at the gut. So there's this whole array of markers that we can get a really great baseline. There's two types of people that come in and wanna do this test. One is um, you know, someone who already has a lot of issues going on and just can't seem to get over the hump or just wants help in addressing and taking the next step to getting healthy. Um, the other is someone who's just looking at it more for prevention, pre preventative measures. I wanna know where my imbalances are so that I can live to be 100 and have great energy to keep up with my grandkids. So I just wanna know now so I can address it. Um, testing literally pulls back the curtain on your health. It exposes those blind spots. And you really, I mean, how many of you know, other than us just telling you, B is really good for managing stress, and vitamin D is really good for your immune system. How do you really know what you need right now in this moment in time for your health? You don't unless you test. Um, so that's, that's why we highly, highly recommend that everyone does testing. Um, what is going to happen is that if you want to purchase, um, we're doing a special. Is it up there? Yeah, well, do you want to talk about this real quick, oh, Debbie's yeah. story? Oh, yeah, Debbie's story. Okay, so this is Debbie. Um, she's been a patient of ours for a while. Um, she came in, and she um, was dealing with a lot of fatigue, like 
chronic fatigue. Um, she literally would even miss her adjustments because she was sleeping all day long. She couldn't get up. She slept all day. She slept all night. She had a lot of digestive issues. Um, pretty much all the common symptoms of digestive issues she was experiencing. Um, she had a lot of pain, a lot of inflammation. She was struggling to lose weight. So we did testing on her. And I will tell you, oftentimes, just by going through a health history, I, I can predict what's going to show up on the test results. And like Dr. Ryan said, just helps to confirm. So we worked together for four months. She put in a lot of hard work. She was really diligent. She too, like Kelly, did things she'd never done before, like juicing. Um, and, and you can see from her test results, we had to focus on her gut. She had a major dysbiosis going on and um, a high fungal marker over there, as well as having issues with toxicity and issues with neurotransmitters. So it was really apparent as to why she was feeling the way she was feeling. So we worked together for four months. Um, we brought her body back into balance, um, retested. And what I'm really excited to share is that She's not suffering from that, that chronic fatigue anymore. She actually is riding her bike. She has a stationary bike. And for her to get on the bike is huge. Um, she has lost almost 30 pounds. And she's at a weight she hasn't been at since before she got married. And she never, ever thought she could get there because she struggled so much just to lose a couple of pounds. Um, and then uh, lastly, <laughs> her husband will come in and just announce to the world how she no longer has leaky gut anymore yeah. and how amazing it is. And Thanks, he's honey. so happy for her. So. <laughs> Good looking out. Yeah. So, I, um, go ahead. Anyway, I was going to say um, the testing we're doing a special. Can I talk about that now? Yeah, I just wanted to say about Debbie though, and okay. and I've I've recognized this with all of our patients over the years, whether it's you know major major transformation with nutrition and this kind of thing, or even with chiropractic care. I the the, the funnest thing for me is seeing the zest for life come back with people that recover their health, and many of you have done that. You know, whether it's through your chiropractic care or nutrition or a combination of both or all five essentials, my favorite thing is seeing that zest for life come back. And we all know that you've got to have your health in order to do that. You know, the, the last thing you're excited about is getting out and conquering your day and, you know, winning your life if your body hurts or if you're suffering or if you have poor health. So anyway, and I've noticed that in yeah. Debbie, I think almost more than anybody else. Like she's yeah, just a bundle just of joy now. Cool. And uh, in the beginning, her husband was like, because initially her husband started care, and I told him, hey, I want your wife to come in so she can see what you're doing and just learn about what, you know, what you're going through so she can support you. And he was just like, oh, no, she's not interested. She would never come here. She's not into this type of thing. And then ultimately, you know, and this is typical, she ends up coming in and even seeing better results or more, a bigger amount of transformation than he did. But yep. anyway, yeah. so yeah, with the, with the test, um, and you, if you want to talk about this, you can. I just wanted yeah. to say we... Um, we vetted Genova. So Genova is the lab that we use, um, and Genova is the best lab in the country. And the reason why we use Genova is because it's the lab that my family and I started using on ourselves years and years ago. And so we just figured if it was good enough for us, it was good enough for patients, and we don't want to compromise. There are cheaper tests out there. They're not as reliable, they're not as accurate, um, and they just don't have quite the reputation. Genova, in my opinion, is the gold standard. If you go to any functional medicine practitioner in the country and they do any kind of advanced nutrition testing, they're gonna use Genova Diagnostics. Um, the metabolomics test mm -hmm. specifically was designed for Max Living. It's pretty cool. They designed this test specifically for Max Living clinics uh, because of the breadth and depth of care that we provide to our patients. And so we basically told them, we need a test that covers all of this stuff in the past, it was multiple tests. You know, in the past, and, may, and some of you may have done this, but it was, a, it was a hair test, it was this, it was this, it was this, it was multiple different types of tests. This is a, a, a all-inclusive, if you will. There's still two components to it. There's a, there's a finger prick blood test, and then there's a urine sample collection, um, and the instructions are in there. You can talk about that in just a minute. But I just wanted to speak to the price for a second, because if you were to call the lab, or if you were to have this lab done, like through a hospital, it's over $2,000 because it's that comprehensive, you know? And really, if we compare it to something that many of us have done in the past, like an MRI or something like that, really in the world of testing, um, it's not unreasonable. However, we just know that if we have a family clinic and we want families to be able to, t to do this on a regular basis, like every one to two years, that's a pretty big investment, you know? And that would be for, even for our family. We have four kids, so for six of us to do this every single year, I mean, that's, that's a car, you know? 
So we found a way, and part of, part of the benefit of being a Max Living patient is we have a lot of purchasing power through Max Living because we have 200 offices, which results in tens of thousands of patients. We went to Genova and basically said, hey, you guys got to figure out a way to get this thing down. Otherwise, we, you know, we're going to be very limited in the number of people that are actually going to be able to do this. So they gave us a price of 750 So our, our cost on it or our relationship with Genova is $750. Um, we were able to figure out a way to reduce that even more just for today. And so just for today, if you guys are interested in doing this, um, we were able to do it for $5.97. Last section, or this last, uh, yeah, section, I guess. There's a couple of different topics. But the first topic that we're going to go over is exercise. And you may not readily associate exercise to good gut health. But I can, I can tell you this, that good exercise um, literally and mechanically in your body is like a massage for your intestines. And that's part of how your body is designed in order to move things along through the process. You know, there's, there's muscles that you have within your intestines and there's this function called peristalsis, which is where those muscles, uh, you know, within the GI tract contract, but you moving the bigger mover muscles in your body also is what helps move things along. And so, you know, I was talking to Cece about this section and she's like, yeah, uh, nine times out of 10, if someone comes to me and they're constipated, I'll just tell them to go, go for a run or do some air squats or, do, you know, do just a short workout. And a lot of times it's enough to just get things moving. The other thing that exercise does is it increases circulation and your GI tract needs blood supply and needs circulation in order to operate, you know, just like an engine needs gasoline. So exercise is really, really critical in terms of having, having really good gut health. And so I would tell you, you know, if you're in a situation where things are stopped up or you're just not feeling good GI-wise, even though it's probably not the first thing you feel like doing, exercising with an upset stomach, sometimes even just some light exercise can make a huge difference. Um, when it comes to exercise, you know, I, I want to shift gears just for a moment and talk about the value of exercise from a philosophical standpoint. And for me, you know, I was, just talk, I was just talking to some folks about this big race that I just did with a bunch of chiropractors in North Idaho called Race the Wolf. And this race is up at Schweitzer Ski Resort up in Sandpoint, if you're familiar with that. And the race was, I mean, it's pretty intense. It was a 50K, so it was like 31 miles. It was over, over uh, almost 7,000 feet of vertical gain. And it's just trail running. You know, you're up and down the ski lifts. And I'd never done anything like that before. And so, you know, I recruited Aaron and seven other Max Living chiropractors from around the country to come do it with me. And uh, it was extremely challenging. There was lots of ups and downs. Unfortunately for me, more downs than ups, but that's a story for another time. But um, I will tell you, you know, because people ask me, like, why do you, you know, why do you do stuff like that? Why do you do Iron Man? Why do you do crazy stuff like this? Um, to me, it's not about having a certain type of body. It's not about abs. Um, it's not about being able to lift a certain amount of weight. Um, it's not about any of that anymore. Um, for me, what it's about is about strengthening my mind because I know that there are so many parallels between fitness and life. You know, sports initially for me, because I'm a lifelong athlete, played college football, so many parallels. But even in just personal fitness, there are so many parallels. And what I have found is that when you can consistently put yourself in uncomfortable situations, which, which if you know anything about fitness, that's the only way that it gets better. Like no pain, no gain. That's where that term comes from. So whether you're, whether you're lifting weights, whether you're running, you're biking, you're swimming, hiking, if your body's not suffering, at least just a little bit, your fitness is not going up. That's just how your body, it's that stress that creates elevated fitness. Um, but what I have found is that so many people are discomfort averse especially in today's day and age. We want to be comfortable. We want everything to be air conditioned. We want everything to be on demand. We want to be able to order our groceries from our phone while we're sitting in this makeover and have them on our doorstep by the time we get home, right? We want everything just so convenient, so comfortable. And so now more than ever, our society today is the most comfortable and weakest in terms of mindset population that we've ever seen in, the, in human history. And willpower is at a premium, meaning there's not a lot of it, right? And it's just simply because we don't have to be very uncomfortable very often. And that's okay. Like, I'm not against air conditioning. I'm glad for it. You know, I'm not against having a car to drive to the office or having food to be able to go buy from a grocery store. But what it's done is it's made us soft. And when we, when we, when we become soft in one area of our lives, we become soft in all areas of our lives. And so to me working out consistently, obliterating all these objections, you know, like, I don't know how, I don't know where to start, don't have time, don't feel like it, it's too difficult, gyms are too expensive, 
listen, we've all got excuses, and they're like another body part of ours that they all stink. You know, we've heard that term, and it's just true. Like, you, you don't want to wait until you, you have to be uncomfortable. You want to choose to be uncomfortable so that when life throws you a situation that's uncomfortable, you're conditioned to deal with it, right? Like, after doing this race, and I will just be 100% transparent and tell you that I did not finish this race, and it, it broke my heart to not be able to finish with my wife. We've been training for six months and all my friends who flew in just to do this thing together. And I'm not going to get into the whole story about why, but um, to me, it wasn't about the finish line. It wasn't about the medal. It was about who I had to become in order to even be on that mountain in the first place. And I will tell you that doing those hard things and conditioning myself to even be there and dealing with the aftermath of not finishing the race was far more valuable than abs that I might have gotten in the process or the medal that you may or may not get when you cross the finish line. Because the reality is, in real life, there's, there's no medal, right? There's no finish line until you fully expire, and then the medal is what you get in eternity. But as far as what we have here and now, that doesn't exist. And so I would just encourage you, you know, if you're the type of person that doesn't like to exercise, you've got all these excuses, the value of exercise is not abs. The value of exercise is to condition your mindset to be comfortable doing uncomfortable things. Because life is life, we are going to be uncomfortable. We're going to have family members diagnosed with illness. We're going to have things happen to us. We're going to have pandemics, right? If you want to be conditioned to weather the storm and to find the opportunity and actually almost look forward to it because you know that there's going to be a lesson to be learned, because there always is. We, we fail forward. We learn from losing, not from winning, right? If you want to do that, working out on a regular basis is an excellent cheap, easy, free way to condition your mindset to become a better person. Um, I do want to say that when it comes to exercise, just really quickly, um, if you need help with this, you know, if this was a really low um, variable on your LRQ, come and talk to one of us because Max Living has a program called Max T3. It's an online program. We can even send you an ebook with lots of uh, information, ideas. Studies now show that you can do high-intensity interval training for 10 to 12 minutes and actually burn more fat for longer than if you long, do long-duration, low-intensity exercise. In fact, there was a study that came out several years ago that compared 12 minutes of high-intensity interval training to an hour of cardio, like low-intensity cardio, and they found that during that hour, the cardio people burn more fat, but after the hour, the high-intensity interval people burn more fat, and it was actually... 36 hours later, the high-intensity interval group was still burning fat and calories, whereas the cardio group was only burning fat and calories for four hours later. So you get a much bigger bang for your buck if you exercise the right way, right? And the good news is you don't need a gym, you don't need a membership, you don't need a personal trainer, but if you need coaching on that, talk to one of us and we'll point you in the right direction. All right, Can I let's talk about thing? toxins. Yes. Is this on? Okay. I actually read a study yesterday um, as far as exercise goes in relationship to your gut health. Um, so research has found that 30 minutes of a hit like workout, well, 15 to 30 minutes, um, three times a week improved the gut microbiome after six weeks. But then what they also found was that the gut reverted back to its prior state after six weeks of doing nothing and being sedentary. So just to show you the, how exercise can um, affect your gut health, uh, sometimes people come to me and say they're constipated, and the first thing I say is, have you been moving? Have you gotten any movement in? Because um, it helps so much just with the gut paralysis and, and getting um, you know, the foods that you're eating through your digestive system. So there's a big connection there. Yep. So we're going we're to talk about toxins here for a few minutes. And uh, toxicity is a huge, huge category or a huge topic that you know, uh, we, do, we do an entire event on in the spring. Um, but we're going to talk just a little bit about how toxins, where toxins hide out, common pitfalls, things to stay away from or avoid, uh, but then also how toxins directly affect um, gut health. Okay, so um, the three toxins that are up on the slide, so herbicides like um, uh, glyphosate, is um, something that negatively affects the gut bacteria, and it literally will alter the bad and good bacteria in our gut. Um, so this can be found in things like Roundup. And just, just think about, um, this really hit home for me when I would go to like the soccer field and I would see the sign saying how they just sprayed the grass, and my kids are out there like rolling around in it, we're walking with no shoes on, and um, it, it just has a huge impact on your health in so many ways. Um, BPA, found in plastic bottles. How many of you drink out of plastic water bottles? 
We all do, right? And so this BPA is just destroying your gut and your gut bacteria um, and just leading to a lot of inflammation and a lot of gut issues. So the biggest thing, if you are drinking out of a water bottle like this, please don't like leave it in your car and then drink from it because those toxins are just leaching into the water. Yeah, the um, biggest thing with plastics is um, plastics uh, give off xenoestrogens and they're hormone mimickers and they disrupt your hormone balance. So they've actually done some studies and they found that um, men that consume very high levels or have high levels of BPA in their system or xenoestrogens from plastics um, have a lot more estrogen. And that can be an issue with women too, but if men have extra estrogen, they develop things like man boobs and other un unwanted you know, physical features. So you know, estrogen, estrogen uh, mimickers and hormone disruptors are just not a good thing for a lot of different reasons. Plastic is unavoidable. I mean, there's so much plastic in the world today, we're not gonna be able to get away from it completely, but you can make changes as far as what you put your water in or you know, use glass containers at home instead of plastic. And if you do use plastic, definitely don't put them in the microwave or the oven. You don't wanna heat them up too much just because that's when those chemical bonds break down and then those xenoestrogens are emitted, so. Um, and then lastly, heavy metals, they also play a huge role in your gut health and will affect um, the gut lining and um, lead to bad bacteria. I have done so many tests where, I mean, every single person has heavy metals in them. Um, aluminum, arsenic, cadmium, um, it's even in our water. It's, I mean, it's everywhere. We live in a toxic world. You just can't get away from it. So I do love testing because it lets you to identify what is in your body like what heavy metals or any other type of toxicities you have, and then how is your body detoxifying? Are there key nutrients that you're missing for the detoxification process to happen? Um, so those are, yeah, the, kind two, of the big three. Two things I wanna mention on heavy metals. The two biggest sources, well, the number one, um, well, I'll just put it this way. The number one uh, hidden source for heavy metal toxicity in our body, can anybody guess it? A lot of you probably have this in your mouth right now. Metal fillings. Yeah, so metal fillings will emer emit a mercury vapor, and that vapor goes through this little bone in your upper palate full of little holes called your cribriform plate, and that mercury vapor can seep through those holes and directly um, you know, get to the brain. It can pass through the blood-brain barrier. So getting your amalgam fillings out is a very, very positive thing to do. And if you need a resource for that, Dr. Horry, Corey Harker at Northwest Natural Dentistry here in Coeur d'Alene, he's very good. He's certified, he's a biological dentist, meaning he's actually certified to take those out because I've had patients and even family members who had their dentist say, oh yeah, I could take those out. And they just literally took them out. Oh, gosh. You can't just do that <laughs> because uh, you could swallow some of it, the vapor, you have to have special suction, special things. Anyway, um, and the good news is nowadays it's way less expensive than it used to be. I mean, you can get your... I, I, when I think when I had mine done, I had a total of six, and I think it was under two grand to get all six of them out, and that was eight years ago, so it's probably less expensive now. But I would highly recommend that. You know, if you're exhibiting toxicity issues, fatigue issues, even cognitive decline prematurely, um, that would be one of the number one places I would start. The other thing is, who knows what the number one source of mercury poisoning is in America today? What is it? Vaccines, the flu shot specifically. Flu shot has thimerosal, which is a mercury preservative, and it's given out to just about everybody, right? So this isn't a pro or anti conversation, um, although if you have questions or you want science, um, come and talk to me. But just know that um, anytime you're putting something that's toxic in your body, your body's gonna have a reaction, and heavy metals are just about the most toxic thing you can put inside your body. The problem is they tell you that, oh, it's such a small amount that it shouldn't matter. Well, there's a small amount from this and a small amount from fish and a small amount from our fillings and a small amount from here and here and here. Before you know it, your body's full of metal and it shouldn't be. And we're wondering why one out of 36 kids now, one out of 36 is diagnosed with autism in America today. One out of 36. I mean, are we really living life that much differently than we were 50 years ago? At some point, we've got to start asking better questions and taking a broad 30,000 foot view and asking, okay, what are the differences between now and then? What are the big things that the majority of people are doing? The number one thing, vaccinations. I mean, if you look at the vaccine schedule now versus even just 10, 20 years ago, I mean, when I was a kid, I think I had three and that was like middle of the road, you know? Now kids are given 
I think it's over 20 in the first year of life. And by the time they're in middle school, they've had like 40 or 50 rounds of vaccinations, you know? So again, this isn't a pro or anti conversation, but we just got to look at things and start asking questions, you know, connecting the dots and asking ourselves is injecting ourselves with poison, you know, which, I mean, it's literally what it is. I mean, you look at, look at the ingredients and that's not my opinion. You can go to the CDC, look up the ingredients for the COVID shot. What's in there? It's poison. And they'll tell you, well, it's a small enough amount. It's not going to, it's still poison, right? It is. God gave you this immune system, this natural immunity. God gave you everything you need to be healthy as long as you do what? Everything you need is in the seed, but you got to do what to the seed? Give the seed what it needs and remove the interference, right? Okay, so detox to improve your gut health. Um, If you can remember what we said before with leaky gut, one of the major leading causes is toxins. So your body wants to do everything it can, especially your gut, to make sure that those toxins are not getting through the gut lining into other areas of your body. Um, This is kind of like a double-edged sword. So you want to make sure that you're not ingesting toxins from the foods you're eating, the air you're breathing, the water you're drinking, even from the chemicals you're putting on your body. Um, If you think about us women, I think, uh, is it around like 30 toxic chemicals we get every day just from putting on our makeup and lotion and everything a lot more in women because of personal care products yeah yep so um we need to protect our gut from those toxins um and on the same front we really need to have a healthy gut in order to detoxify properly so what are some of the main ways that toxins get out of your body does anybody know sweat urine and stool So you need to have a healthy digestive system so that you're eliminating every single day so that those toxins are leaving the body. Um, Well, I wanted to say this real quick too. Just the other reason why gut health is so important in terms of toxins, because even even if you're doing everything you can to avoid toxins, toxic exposure is inevitable on a daily basis. And the thing is, is even if you're not putting very many toxins in, and this is what your gut lining looks like. The other purpose of your gut lining is it's not just to bring things in, but it's also to keep things out. And if this is what your gut lining looks like, guess what? You're getting unwanted things through these holes and your body's not able to poop them out on the other end, right? Or sweat them out because they're actually getting into your bloodstream. And once they get into your bloodstream, so much more challenging to get them out, right? Mm-hmm. So when it comes to detoxification, um, you know, having, having, a healthy gut is essential. I mean, it's yep. not an option. Yep, absolutely. Do you want to talk about these at yeah. all? Yeah, so, so there's different phases that you have um, in the detoxification process, and there's key nutrients that are really important for them. Um, so I just can't read that far. I should have brought my glasses. <laughs> um, I'm going to come over here. Now you can see where I need to focus some of my health on is my eyes. Um, so... Phase two blockers. So a lot of the time, obviously, as the site says, we're unaware of even being exposed to chemicals just from the environment that we live in. Um, I think one of the biggest things I want to talk about is that um, you need like very specific antioxidants and nutrients, like I said, in order for detoxification to happen. The last thing you want to do is to block those pathways because you are going to be so incredibly sick. Um, your body works really hard to take a, a toxin and turn it from being fat soluble to water soluble so that it can then exit. We're able to test. We're able to test if you need those nutrients and what is missing from your body. God created an amazing system inside you to keep you healthy. Um, We just have to make sure that we give it what it wants. Um, Another thing too is that it's an overload of time. Just living your life, right? It's important to know that when you're born, the toxins that your mom had pass through you through the um, umbilical cord into you. So you're like literally born already with toxins inside you. And then it's this accumulation over time. So just like this slide says, just being surrounded by things at work, even the carpet in your own home, the water you're drinking, it all collectively fills up your toxic bucket. And so you just have to work hard to make sure that you are dumping that bucket because it's just going to get filled up again. Yeah, ultimately when it comes to toxicity, it's just one of those things that I think step one is just the realization that you're being exposed to toxins on a regular basis, whether you think so or know so or not. Um, and just 
understanding that you're never, you're never going to get the bucket completely empty and then keep it completely empty, meaning detoxification should be part of your lifestyle. It's not something you do every once in a while. You know, if you're, if you're a patient that's been around for long enough, you've probably heard me say that I do our detox system. So we, we're not talking about that really much today, but Max Living has a detox system that gets toxins out of the cells, step one, gets toxins out of the body, step two. And I do that system personally at least twice a year. And depending on, you know, uh, what else is going on and where I'm spending a lot of my time, if it's like a more toxic environment, then I'll do it, you know, sometimes three to four times a year. But at the very minimum, I would say the average person needs to go through a detox, like, a, like an intentional specific detox twice a year, every six months. Um, so if you need more information about that, we can help you. And, you know, your LRQ should point you in that direction if that's something you need to focus on right now anyway. Should you stop all your supplements while you're detoxing? That's a great question. And the answer is no. But having some guidance and coaching as far as how to make the most of that would be really beneficial. Yeah, because there, there is an order that you want to follow. You know, you don't want to be detoxing, renewing your gut health, um, you know, reducing inflammation. Typically, you don't want to be trying to address all of those things all at the same time. However, uh, doing many things at once can sometimes serve the same exact purpose. So like when I do the detox program, I don't stop everything that I'm doing, but I usually, I usually go back to more of a baseline set of supplements. Like I just, I take our daily essentials, which is just like all the, all the nutrients that you need. So it's got uh, omega-3 fish oil, it's got a multivitamin, B complex, magnesium, and vitamin D. And so I take that every day and I pretty much take that every day, no matter what I'm doing. That's just like the, the basics, the essentials. If I'm going to detox, though, I'll continue to take those, and then I'll most likely stop anything else that I'm doing just because I don't want my body, my physiology going in two different directions. Yeah, that's a good question. You want to talk about gut brain? Yep. We so the way, have, uh, yeah, the way you think, your mindset, it all has a very powerful influence over what um, you're going to stress about. Um, and how you respond to stress is incredibly important. Um, we already talked about how stress really hinders digestion and leads to leaky gut. Gosh, we say leaky gut a lot today, huh? Well, and there's kind of different, kind of two different ways to look at this. So like in the, in the first half, I use the example of two different people who are going through COVID. One has a crummy microbiome, one has a really healthy one, and how that affects your mindset going through something. But you can also go, go at it from the other direction, you know, because you have power over your mind too and how if you can control your mind and control your thoughts and have an attitude of gratitude and focus on you know, being aware and mindfulness, you can actually positively affect the way that your gut functions as well. So it goes both directions, and that's why it's the gut-brain connection, and it's not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. You know, how you think directly impacts your gut, and how healthy your gut is or isn't directly impacts how you think. So this section is a little bit more about how you think, and I touched on this you know, opening the second half here, but it's, you know, stress in and of itself is not a bad thing. You know, how, how is it that one person can go through an extremely stressful situation? Like one of my favorite books of all time is a, a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And it was written by Viktor Frankl, who was a psychologist during World War, World, 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 World War II. And he was a Jew who was put in a Nazi concentration camp. And he went through this experience. And as horrendous as it was, and all the atro atrocious things that he witnessed, witnessed, he still came out of it and found a way to turn it into a learning opportunity and a way that he could better serve people after the fact, right? Whereas so many other people went through the same exact situation and it just crushed them. It crushed their mindset and they became anxious and depressed and they committed suicide or you know, whatever might've happened to them. It, it all had to do with his perception. And he was taking a situation and looking at it from the outside in going, how can I turn this into a positive thing, right? And if he can turn that into a positive thing, I think we can turn our work deadlines or our, you know, brown grass or our, you know, uh, griping kids or whatever it is that's getting under our skin. We can turn those things into a positive things thing, but you have to be intentional, right? You have to be intentional. One of the most powerful things that I have found personally that helps me do this is by uh, practicing gratitude, you know, it's, it's peace management. People say stress management all the time. That's kind of like saying debt management. Nobody wants to manage their debt, right? You want to manage what you want more of. So instead of saying stress management, I'm going to try to manage my stress. Let's manage your peace instead. And a really simple thing that you can do every day that puts your mind into a state of gratitude and helps you gain perspective is gratitude journal. You know, so every morning I take five minutes, sometimes longer, but usually just five minutes, and I just write down three things I'm grateful for. And it could be simple, it could be sunshine, it could be, you know, wine and conversation on the deck with my wife, you know, looking at the mountains or what, you know, just whatever it might be, a good night's sleep, 
whatever it might be, attitude of gratitude makes a huge difference. And then what happens is you set the mental thermostat for the day. And who knows that you attract more of what you think about, what you think about comes about, which is kind of scary if you actually stop and think about what you're thinking about most times, right? I mean, think about that. And, you know, you look at what's, what's on the news. This is, why, this is why fasting from the news or fasting from social media can be such a positive thing. Because if you watch enough news and you look at enough social media, it obviously changes what you think about and how you think. And ultimately, you continue to think about it, even though you shut the news off, you're continuing. And what sells on the news, positive or negative? negative? Fear is what sells. Fear is what keeps you glued to the TV. The little death count ticker on the bottom of the you know, news channel is what keeps you tuning back in, right? I mean, who did that when COVID first started? Who, who kept tuning back in every other day? I did, and I never watched the news. I'm like, I just want to see it. That's so sick. Why do I want to see it? Why? It's because fear and travesty, it's, it's addictive, right? And it, it com- it's compelling, but it's not what God wants us to focus on, right? He hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a victory. So Can I add fast from the news. Can I add something about you sure the can. gut? Um, okay, so your nervous system, you have two sides. You have a parasympathetic and your sympathetic state. And we live in a world where we brag about how stressed out we are, right? It's, not, it's like you're not doing enough if you aren't super stressed all the time. Um, when you're in that sympathetic state, you're in what we call a fight or flight state. When you are in a parasympathetic state, you are in your rest and digest state. Rest and digest. Think about your digestion is actually turned on. You're able to absorb and utilize your nutrients. Everything is working the way it's supposed to in your digestion. Your heart rate is lower. Your body can heal. Your body can work the way it's supposed to. When you're in the opposite state, where you're in that sympathetic state, your digestion is absolutely 100% turned off. No matter how good you're eating, you're not going to absorb and utilize those foods that you just ingested, right? Your heart rate is much higher. Um, I mean, it's like the, they're the polar opposites of one another. You can't ever be in both states. You're either in one or the other, and most people are stuck in that sympathetic state. Um, so it's really, really important to do just as Dr. Ryan said and start to practice some of these ways to de-stress. The best thing you can do for your digestion is when you are eating, you are literally in a relaxed state, you are taking your time, you are thankful for the food that you're eating. If you go back to um, lots of cultures, they, I mean, they spend like four hours to eat one meal. It's a big event and they just take their time and they do lots of prayer and they're thankful for their food and it will just go a long way. So if anything, just learn how to slow down and be in a relaxed state when you're eating. Yeah, I read a book a, book a few years ago called Peak Performance and I thought the book was gonna be all about how to do more in less time. I thought it was going to be like how to multitask even more, how to get even more done, how to do even more in the 24 hours that you have. And it kind of rocked my world because it turned out this guy's a sports psychologist and he works with all these Olympians and pro athletes and stuff. And the whole book ended up being about rest and doing less. And, but the thing that stuck with me, and he has this line in there, and he had, to, you know, he had an athlete he was working with just was overtraining, overtraining, overtraining. And... I, th- I, th- I feel like we do that in our society today, right? Because you look at Instagram, and you, ever, you look at everybody's highlight reel, and you compare them to your behind the scenes. And you're like, I got to do more, I got to do more, I got to do more. Um, but he goes, you know, when you're, when you're lifting weights, you're not building muscle while you're lifting weights. When do you build muscle? When you're resting. When you're running, you're actually not in- improving your cardiovascular fitness while you're running. In fact, if you kept running and you didn't stop, what would eventually happen to you? you die if you kept running, right? It's like, oh, that guy runs a lot. He's super fit. He must be super, he's constantly running. No, he's actually killing himself because the fitness happens in the rest. You know, when you're being chased by a bear in the woods, that's the fight or flight response. That's the stress response, the, the sympathetic response. There's really good things that happens physiology, uh, physiologically when you're being chased by a bear in the woods. What happens? Your heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, your short-term immune system goes up because you have two, you have short-term, long-term, right? Your, your mental acuity goes up, but, you're long, but there's also a bunch of stuff that gets shut off. Digestion shuts off. Muscle building and cellular repair shut off. Long-term memory shut off. Reason and logic shut off, <laughs> right? What are the most common signs and symptoms of people that are chronically stressed? High blood pressure, high cholesterol, weakened immune system, uh, forgetfulness, memory issues, cognitive decline. 
right? Why is that? It's because your body's in a mild state of that fight or flight all the time. So it is important to practice mindfulness, gratitude, slow down, you know, go hard when it's time to go hard, but then go easy when it's time to go easy. And I think I'm preaching myself more than anybody right now, but it is important, right? Also Super that sleep important. is really important. Just remember while you are sleeping, that is the time that your body is able to heal, right? So um, some things you can to do as far as digestion is stop eating two hours before you go to bed so that your body can focus on not digesting your food that you just ate, but on recovering and healing and growing and doing all those things it needs to. So make sleep a priority. Back to the real definition of health for just a minute. You know, I, I love, I always love this section and it's not because I'm a chiropractor, but it's because to me, this is what ties it all together. You know, again, if you're, if you're a patient, you probably already understand this, but if you're a guest, you might still have kind of questions about like, well, I get, the, I get the other four essentials. Why is chiropractic one of the five essentials? Like five is not very many. Why does chiropractic get to be one of the five? Well, you need to know that it's not about chiropractic and it's not about the bones in your spine. It's also not about popping your back. It's about the fact that your, that your nervous system, which just happens to be on the inside of your spine, it's your nervous system that runs and regulates all of this stuff. Everything that we talked about today, hormone balance, microbiome, gut health, gut healing, digestion, elimination, all of that stuff is regulated by your nervous system. And we, and we know that's true because if you put a dead body and a live body side by side, they have the exact same pieces and parts, don't they? And if it's a fresh dead body, they even have fresh warm blood in there. I know it's kind of morbid, but it's the truth. What's the difference in a dead body and a live body? It's not the parts and pieces. What's the difference? In a dead body, the brain is not sending signals through the nervous system to animate and bring to life the tissue cells of the body. It's your nervous system that runs and controls everything. Why do I say this? Well, back to the vitality continuum. Health, the definition of health is when your body's functioning at 100% or as close to it as possible. And everything that we talked about today, exercise, detox, mindset, nutrition, all of these things improve function in your body. But there's only one system in the body that controls the function. And again, that's your nervous system, right? And that's not my opinion. I mean, page four, Gray's Anatomy, the nervous system controls and coordinates all functions of your body. Heartbeat, breathing, digestion, hormone balance, anything. Immune system, your nervous system reigns supreme. And what you need to know is that structure affects function and function affects structure, right? You, you can't have a bad spine and have a healthy nervous system, right? You, you, you can't happen. You know, we all know that from front to back, our spines have to be straight up and down. From the side, you may not know this, but you should have curves. And then I think what's obvious and intuitive is the fact that all the bones in your spine have to be lined up. And if your spine's in the right position, your body can function and heal at 100% because you basically have no interference running through the nervous system. It's like the electrical wires in this building. As long as there's no interference, the projectors work, the screens work, the lights work. But if I go in and I cut a, cut a wire that goes to any one of those appliances, what happens to the appliance? It shuts off because there's interference. You're blocking the flow of power or energy through the medium in which that energy has to flow to control things. Your nervous system is the same exact way, right? And so what happens in life because of slips, trips, and falls, car accidents, sports injuries, bad posture, probably the most detrimental thing that the most amount of people do nowadays is this right here. Anybody out, anybody been out in public lately and people watched for any given amount of time? Everyone's doing this, yep. even in their cars, which is scary, right? But even out on date night, you know, Aaron and I go on a date night uh, Thursday nights and even couples, you know, sitting at the same table are like this I know, they don't, and they're probably texting each other. Just, we're just that used to it, you know, it's like, hey, what do you want to eat? Um, but because of life, our spine can shift out of alignment. And I want, I want you guys to know this term. If you're a patient, you should know this, but if you're a guest, this is important. The term is subluxation and subluxation is anytime your spine shifts out of alignment. And that can happen when one bone shifts just a tiny bit. It can happen when your whole entire spine shifts. Either way, when your spine's out of alignment, it's called subluxation. And the reason why subluxation is so dangerous, it's not because subluxation causes back pain. Does subluxation cause back pain? It can. Can subluxation cause migraine headaches or tension headaches or neck issues or tight shoulders or sciatic pain or numbness? It can. That's not why subluxation is so dangerous. The reason why subluxation is so dangerous is two things. Number one, only 8% of the nerves in your body feel pain, which means you can have subluxation choking off nerve supply to a part of your body and have no idea. We know that's a fact because my mother-in-law would have for sure felt the cancer that was riddled throughout her body if, her if all of her nervous system would have felt pain. 
Unfortunately, all the, all the nerves that are on the inside of your body that control all the stuff that actually matter, you don't have sensory fibers in those nerves. Most of the sensory fibers that you have in your body are on the periphery. That's why you can feel every little thing on your skin, but you can't feel a, a, a coronary bl artery blockage in your heart, even if it's 95%. We had a patient a few years ago, 98% blockage in his coronary artery, had a heart attack just like that, had no signs or symptoms leading up to it. His doctor said that that was probably slowly happening over the course of 20 years. Right? So the number one reason why subluxation is so dangerous is that most of the time you don't feel it. The second reason is because it affects function, right? And that's what we're going to talk about for just a second. I'm not going to read all this, but I do think what's interesting, these are peer-reviewed medical journals, not chiropractic journals, medical journals, who have found that when the spine is subluxated or out of alignment, it affects function. This first one is all about immune function. They have found that vertebral deformity or subluxation in your upper back affects your immune system. That's why if, you're, if you call in and you say, Dr. Ryan, I'm sick, I'm not feeling good, I think I need to cancel my appointment, my team is going to tell you, nope, you're not, we're going to get you in off hours, that's the most important time for you to get adjusted. And most likely, I'm going to adjust your upper back, because that's where your immune system is controlled by. Second one is about forward head posture. This is the most common subluxation pattern in America today. And everybody st stood up like this when I said that. <laughs> good job, you got your cue. Anyway, what happens is when your head goes forward, right? And it gets stuck like that after years of doing this. What it, what it does is it obviously it can lead to things like headaches or neck pain or upper back pain. But this was uh, Dr. Rene Callier, who's a medical doctor at USC. He found that forward head posture results in, in lung capacity by up to 30%. And what's it say? The entire gastrointestinal system is affected. You want to clear up your GI system? It's going to be very challenging, even with the metabolomics test and the gut renew and all the stuff, changing your diet. You're walking around like this, you're fighting an uphill battle, just relative to GI uh, health, amongst other things. Okay? Forward head posture. That's why we make you do the head weights in the office. That's why I'm constantly asking you guys, if you come in to get adjusted, are you doing your head weights? Are you doing your neck traction? Are you laying on the neck roll? Right? It's not because I care about your neck pain as much as I care about your longevity and your lung capacity, things like that. Here's another one. Hyperkyphotic posture, this is where your shoulders round forward and your head goes forward and the curve in your neck is bent the wrong way. Hyperkyphotic is a predictor of early mortality. What's mortality mean? You die, you die earlier than you should for obvious reasons, right? And last one, abnormal uh, change in spinal curvature, specifically loss of lumbar lordosis, leads to pelvic or organ prolapse and incontinence. So that's basically where this curvature that's supposed to be in your lower back. If you look at someone from the side, they're supposed to have a curve this way. If you lose that curve, which most commonly happens from too much what? Sitting. Because who sits in their chair like this all day long? You might start that way. I do. But even I, after a couple hours, right? If you're doing a lot of sitting, just like this, you're forcing that curve backwards. And what happens? That, push, that causes pressure on the nerves in your lower back that go to those organs, female reproductive organs and organs of elimination, whether it's your bladder or your lower colon. All right. So how do you know? How do you know if your spine right now is affecting the way your body's functioning? Well, it's the same way you know whether or not your nutrition is affecting your physiology. It's to, to look, to test, test don't guess. So this is really interesting. And uh, this is actually uh, a picture of someone you know. This is, <laughs> this is CC. <laughs> so the x-ray on the left is what the spine should look like, okay? So if you're looking at someone from front to back, the hips and pelvis should be level, spine should be perfectly up and down. The x-ray on the right is CC's x-ray. Who can tell me what's wrong with CeCe's x-ray? So I'm actually going to let you talk about this for just a moment. Okay, so I did that test that you do in junior high where they have you bend over and they tell you if you have scoliosis or not. Of course, I had scoliosis, right? I shared my health history with you with the amount of digestive issues I had starting in high school and all throughout my life and how that just spiraled into worse conditions and issues and so on and so forth. Never once... Never once did anyone ask me if I had scoliosis. Never once did I ever have a recommendation to go to a chiropractor. This, this is that missing link. I shared how I was, when I went to transform my health, I was doing four of the five essentials. This was what was missing. And I have to tell you, after I had my x-rays done and I met with Dr. Ryan and he told me what was going on, I called my mom and I was like, what? Why didn't you? What were you thinking? And anyway, she had no idea. And that's, that's okay. She just didn't know. But now you know. And if I could go back in time, I 100% would because I know that this is a huge reason why I went through everything that I did for the last 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and so, so, you know, again, again is, is it important, important to eat well and 
re renew and repair your gut and all that, yes, of course. I mean, we wouldn't have spent three hours on it if it wasn't. Um, at the end of the day, though, your spine has to be healthy. Structure affects function. You know, that's why when patients come to our office, whether it's for hormone imbalance, digestive issues, musculoskeletal pain, it doesn't matter what you come into the office with. The system that we're, we're checking first is the spine and nervous system. Because think about it, with her spine looking like that, if she does all of this other stuff, but those nerves, if you didn't connect the dots, by the way, that's her lower back. Where do the nerves in the lower back go to? What organs? Digestive organs. Is there any coincidence or is there any question why she's battled GI issues her whole life? You know, and, they, and they found this technically. Someone found it in middle school, but they just never did an x-ray. Nothing was actually done about it. You know, she could have avoided all that. So this does not mean that you just get adjusted and all your problems go away. This is one of the five essentials, but it also is the most important, and it's the keystone that unlocks the potential for all the other four. Does that make sense? And it's not because of your spine, it's because of your nervous system. It's also why, if you're a current patient, you have to continue to maintain your spine, because we still do things like this, and like this, and like this, or whatever it is. We still live life, we still become subluxated, and I do too. You know, that's why I get adjusted every week, and I have for 20 years. I don't have back pain. I don't have headaches, I don't take medication, I don't do any of that stuff, I don't get sick, hardly ever, but I get adjusted so that my body continues to function and operate at its very, very best, right? So the question is, how do you, how do you know? You know, obviously you know because of symptoms, you know because, you know, you've had an x-ray and someone's already told you, but how, how would you otherwise know? Well, you might know from some of these things. You know, all of these things can be caused by a subluxated spine. You know, ultimately the best way to know whether or not your spine is what's causing your major health issue today is to test, not guess, you know, and we do that by taking x-rays. And so just as we wrap this up, um, well, if you, last thing I want to tell you is, um, well, a couple things, I guess. If you didn't have time during the lunch break and you still have questions about any of the supplements that we talked about um, or anything else for that matter, we're going to hang around and answer questions. The product table is still open out there. So if you have anything you still wanted to pick up, you're more than welcome to go do that. Um, I also wanted to say, you know, like in, like in the very beginning, the, the, the power that comes from doing this is not in the information, it's not in the supplements, it's not in coming in for x-rays or even getting adjusted. The power, in my opinion, is the people sitting this, in this room. It's, it's collective energy, it's synergy, it's accountability, it's culture, it's community, it's all of us knowing like what helped me through COVID, you want to know the honest truth, what helped me get through COVID was knowing that every single one of you was going through it at the same time and thinking about things the same way I was, asking the same kinds of questions, challenging the, certain, the same types of assertions being fed to us through the media. It gave me comfort and it actually gave me confidence. You know, it gave me courage. You having courage, being here on a Saturday morning gives other people courage and that's actually the definition of encouragement. It's you having courage. So the last thing I'll leave you with is just continue to have courage. Continue to show up. You know, just continue to be part of the family. That's why we do what we do. All right, guys. I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Cece, anything you want to add as we no, close? No, just thank you. I just love being a part of this team and a part of this mission. And you guys are like my family. So thank you for coming today. Okay. Be blessed. <laughs>